Welcome everyone to the second day of our webinar on the social behavioral and economic impacts of COVID-19. Um, we had got started with an excellent day yesterday and I'm looking forward to an equally exciting day today. Um, we'd like to have a brief welcome by uh, Dr. Uh, Joshua Gordon, the director of uh, National Institute of Mental Health. Dr. Gordon, would uh, you like to go ahead please? Yeah, well, thanks, Erica. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today virtually, um, and especially a, pl a pleasure to see the culmination or maybe the midpoint of uh, so many wonderful research projects that have been sponsored by the uh, SBE initiative over the last couple of years. Uh, and the National Institute of Mental Health was one of the founding institutes of this initiative, and we've been involved in the get-go uh, because it uh, uh, the SB initiative is aligned well with NIMH priorities in the context of, of COVID-19. NIMH supports research uh, to understand both the effects of the pandemic on mental health, uh, and, and by pandemic I mean writ large, as I'll get to in a moment, and uh, importantly to develop, test, and implement evidence-based approaches to mitigate these impacts. Uh, these efforts align with our overall strategic plan, uh, particularly in areas of uh, uh, as, as we've described in our traumatic stress and mental health disparities research programs. The, uh, the, the pandemic, of course, as you all know, and as you all are studying, has had a myriad of effects. And some of those effects arise from the pandemic itself, uh, from uh, those who've been infected, from those who've died, uh, and from their loved ones. Uh, and also, of course, from the mitigation measures that were instantiated to reduce the direct effects of the pandemic. Uh, and then finally, the economic impacts of those mitigation measures. And it is challenging to disentangle the relative contributions of those three factors, uh, but it is nonetheless crucial that we do so. It is crucial because we need to be able to give policymakers a thorough understanding of uh, the effects of these various contributions um, so that they can make informed decisions about how to meet the next pandemic challenge. And frankly, so that they can continue to meet the challenges of COVID-19 as uh, the pandemic itself uh, moves into this, uh, let's say, subacute phase. Um, I, I know that you've been, uh, you don't need any introduction to the SBA and SBE initiative itself. You probably heard that yesterday, plus you've all been sharing your information. So I just wanted to uh, uh, say one more word about NIMH's own focuses of research on the mental health impacts of the pandemic, which are, of course, a, a, a very important component to many of your research programs. We knew before the pandemic started uh, more or less what to expect. We knew that there would be significant increases in the rates at which individuals describe mental distress, um, and, and including uh, the rates at which individuals meet criteria for mental illnesses. We also knew that the majority of those individuals would recover as the pandemic abated. And in fact, we've seen those two things. We've seen dramatic increases in the rates at which, for example, individuals describe symptoms of depression, of anxiety, of uh, increased substance use and substance misuse, and of suicidal ideation. At the same time, many of those symptoms have risen and fallen directly in concert with or in correlation with the uh, case rates, uh, even, even in locality by locality basis. So we know that the mental health effects rise and they fall. Of course, they don't fall for everyone and they're not equally severe. And in particular, the main focus of the SBE initiative, underserved and underrepresented populations, are the ones that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, are the ones uh, who are also hardest hit by the, mental, uh, by the mental health impacts. And we knew this going in as well. We knew that risk factors for more chronic and more severe mental health impacts included uh, um, uh, 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 food insecurity, housing insecurity, inability to meet basic needs, um, as well as uh, the, the, the proximity of exposure to the traumatic effects of a disaster. And as you know, it is these underserved and vulnerable communities that have seen the highest rates of COVID, the highest rates of death from COVID on and on. And this of course cuts across many different kinds of vulnerable and underserved communities, whether we're talking about uh, racial and ethnic minorities, 
or rural communities or frontline workers, including healthcare workers, but also including those who had to continue working even in the early days of the significant shutdowns. I'm talking about grocery store clerks. I'm talking about delivery personnel. I'm talking about people who maintain the infrastructure to make sure that we have lights in our houses and heat in our homes. So I want to recognize that these mental health impacts have been distributed unequally, and therefore our research has to be distributed to ensure that we uh, understand how to mitigate these impacts in these vulnerable communities. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it back over to Erica and the, the committee. I want to thank all of the many folks both in inside and outside NIH who have put this uh, remarkable two days of, of, uh, of workshops together uh, for us, and I really look forward to hearing more from all of you about your work. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. That was an excellent way to start the second day. Next, next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, there we go. So just to remind everyone about the ground rules, um, all attendees are muted until 4.30 when we'll start the virtual networking. Um, any questions about the webinar itself, technical difficulties, et cetera, you can email um, or chat Sarah Johns. Um, for any questions you have uh, for presenting for presenting um, PI, please use the Zoom chat feature and make clear which who to whom you're directing the question. Um, if you have a question for multiple PIs, please also make that clear. Um, feel free to send in questions at any point during the webinar. Some will be answered during a live Q&A at the end of each session, while others will be answered in the chat. Um, and please check the chat from time to time to see if, if your question was answered. Next slide. Um, and here's the agenda today. We'll have uh, a couple breaks. Um, and then after the closing remarks, um, we'll have uh, two more virtual networking sessions, more information on that later. Next slide. Um, and again, just a reminder of the meeting objectives are to identify, communicate, and document key findings, to increase collaboration among the different SBE teams, providing a forum for discussion between researchers of similar interests, and to provide space for SBE leadership to communicate their efforts, reflections, and hopes for the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yep, there we go. And we will now begin with our first um, session of the day, social networks, um, for which I am the moderator. Um, so our first talk will be by Drs. Hockley, Waite, Finch, Compernoli, and Zhang. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and start. I think Drs. Waite and Hockley may be on mute. Okay, is that better? There, there we go, that's better. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Um, the, the slide you're seeing here is about the facts about the COVID study, but by way of backdrop for all of the talks in this first panel, they're all about uh, data that comes from the National Social Life, Health and Aging Project, which started in 2005 with a nationally representative sample of older adults. Um, and age 57 to 85, we've been following them every five years. We grew that sample in 2010 by adding the partners of those people. In 2015, we added a new cohort of the so dubbed baby boomers. And we went to all of those we could reach in the COVID era between September and January, September of 20 and January of 21, uh, to 4,852 of those previous respondents and got 2,672 of those people to respond to the COVID survey specifically. So that gave us a conditional response rate of 58% roughly. And we have this breakdown where uh, most of the people responded by web and uh, a large number by paper and pencil and a few by phone. Um, we are glad to have had the prior data for NCHAP so that we have a reference point. We can compare what's happening during COVID to what was happening five years earlier, for example. Um, next slide. Uh, basically just setting up the topics for these three, uh, we're calling the moderating and explanatory factors for the relationship between social contact and mental health. So I'll turn it over to the first speaker who I believe is Laura Finch. 
Bears. Thanks so much for that and shop introduction, Dr. Hockley. And today I'll be talking about resilience, social contact, and loneliness during the pandemic. Next slide. So it's very well known that social relationships promote well being and mental health. And yet in the pandemic era, it's been challenging, of course, to maintain social connections. And we do see some evidence that older adults' mental health appeared to worsen in the early stages of the pandemic. And older adults in particular were especially encouraged to shift their social connections to more remote contacts in lieu of in-person contacts. Yet only about a quarter of older adults report increasing these remote contacts. So one question we're interested in is who might be especially likely to increase these remote contacts? And a group that we had in mind was resilient folks. Next slide. So resilience is another protective factor for mental health. And this is the capacity to withstand, recover from, and even thrive despite adversity. So we can think of trait resilience as having a sort of resilient personality. Next slide. So here we had a few different goals and aims. First, we wanted to know is greater resilience associated with a few types of social contact. We were interested in whether it was linked with greater frequency of in-person and remote modes of contact during the pandemic, as well as whether it might be associated with greater likelihood of increasing various modes of social contact since the pandemic began. Second, is greater resilience associated with a smaller increase in loneliness from before to during the pandemic? And then finally, does social contact frequencies and changes in these perhaps explain any associations between resilience and changes in loneliness? Or alternatively, could these be having independent associations with loneliness? Next slide. So in terms of our measures, we had a four item resilience scale that was assessed in 2015 to 16. And this is a validated scale from a special NSHAP issue of JGSS. We also had the three item UCLA loneliness scale and this identical scale was asked both in 2015 to 16 and during the pandemic allowing direct comparison. Next slide. So in terms of our social contact measures, we first had the respondents report on during a typical week during the pandemic, how often that they reached out to connect with friends and family not living with them via these four modes of contact. We have phone calls, various types of messages, video calls, as well as in-person visits. And then after these items, they also had some follow-up things they reported, which was asking about whether these frequencies represented an increase, a decrease, or about no change compared to before the pandemic began. And you can see in the boxes here that we did dichotomize these variables so that we had an indicator for whether they were having at least weekly, which we thought of as regular contact, as well as whether they had increased these contacts relative to a maintenance or a decrease in the contacts. Next slide. So getting into our findings, first for AIM-1, we found that resilience in 2015 to 16 was associated with more frequent contact with family via phone and messaging during the pandemic. And resilience was also associated with more frequent contact with friends via all four of the different modes we inquired about. Finally, resilience was associated with greater odds of increasing video contact with family and or friends since the pandemic began. Next slide. So in model one here, getting into the loneliness findings, as we expected, greater 2015 resilience was associated with lower loneliness during the pandemic, controlling, controlling for 2015 loneliness and key covariates. Next, could social contact be a pathway associating, uh, explaining this association? And in model two, we see the results for that question. Of the current contact frequency variables, only regular in-person contact was significantly associated with loneliness. And that is what we see in model two. When we have both the regular in-person contact and resilience in there, we can see that these seem to be independent associations that each contribute to lower loneliness. Then in model three, we found that increased video contact with friends was actually associated with greater loneliness. And when we have this included with resilience in the same model, we again see independent effects of each with loneliness. Next slide. 
to, to, to sum it up, we see that resilience may both reflect a positive attitude that protects against loneliness, but also foster social behaviors supporting mental health. In future studies, we'd like to assess causality. Next slide. Thank you so much. If I'm the one introducing, let's just wheel on through these since we're on limited time. Thank you very much, Laura. That was very um, succinctly delivered. Um, so Nell Compernell. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Finch. Today, I'll be presenting a study with colleagues at NORC and at the University of Chicago entitled Variation in Mental Health by Cognitive Functioning Among Older Adults During the COVID-19 Pandemic, the Role of Social Resources. Next slide, please. So what do we know? First, cognitive decline has been linked with adverse mental health, with particularly higher prevalence of depression and anxiety. And while it's di difficult to parse out the directionality, it's also been linked with social contact as well as social support. A separate, a separate set of studies have long documented social connectivity as well as better health and well being outcomes. But of course, social connectivity during the COVID 19 pandemic has been difficult to maintain, in large part due to social distancing guidelines. And studies have documented the adverse effects that these guidelines have had on mental health. Next slide, please. So here we aim to, next slide, please. Think about these three concepts together. First, we aim to understand the extent to which older adults' mental health during the pandemic is related to their pre-pandemic cognitive functioning, as well as whether this association varies by declines or excuse me is explained by declines in social contact and or social support next slide please we use a cognitive functioning from round three of the nshap using mocha 18 items and we rescale it to go from zero to 30 with higher measures indicating higher cognitive functioning and just as dr finch presented we include a number of dichotomous measures created using items that assessed the frequency with which respondents communicated or connected with friends and family, and we focus specifically on in-person contact, as well as the frequency with which they um, received tangible and emotional support. In particular, we focus on whether individuals experience declines in in-person social contact with family and friends, and declines in emotional and tangible support, respectively. We focus on two dimensions of mental health assessed in round three, as well as in the COVID substudy. One is a general assessment of happiness, ranging from one unhappy to five happy, as well as the three item loneliness, score, UCLA loneliness score ranging from three to nine with higher values indicating more frequent loneliness. We also include a number of key co covariates, social demographic measures, um, living arrangements during COVID, concern over COVID, as well as the same dimension of mental health in round three. Next slide, please. Here we present results from multi-linear regression models that weight responses based on respondents' likelihood of participating in the COVID sub-study. And results for happiness are in the leftmost models and loneliness in the rightmost models. First, results suggest that higher cognitive functioning is associated with less frequent loneliness during the pandemic, net of key covariates, as well as loneliness assessed in round three. Next slide, please. Results also are consistent with existing studies that show that decreases in social contact, particularly with friends, is associated with adverse health, mental health outcomes during COVID. Again, that is less happiness as well as more frequent loneliness. Next slide, please. Interestingly, it, when including these declines in social contact, it results suggest that these declines do not explain the association between pre-pandemic cognition as well as loneliness during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Moving now to social support. Again, results suggest that declines in emotional support in particular 
are really are associated with um, mental health outcomes, adverse mental health outcomes during the pandemic. So less happiness as well as more frequent loneliness. Next slide, please. And interestingly, declines in emotional support do explain in part this association between cognition and loneliness during the pandemic. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? Higher cognitive functioning pre-pandemic is associated with less frequent loneliness during the pandemic. And this can be explained in part by a decline in emotional support from before, between before and during the pandemic. In all results highlight the importance of considering social resources when examining links between pre-pandemic cognition and mental health during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Thank you. You can go forward one more slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Compernol. We'll now segue to our next uh, presentation. Next slide. Um, Amanda Zhang will be talking about video calling again. Uh, we have addressed that in a number of ways already. In this um, presentation, we're talking about the role of this in people with sensory impairment. So Amanda, please. All right. Um, my talk is entitled, uh, Can Video Calling Protect Older Adults from Depression Associated with Sensory Impairment? Uh, next slide, please. Sensory impairment is very common in older adults. One in six Americans over the age of 70 uh, report trouble with their vision, and one in four experience issues with their hearing. Uh, vision and hearing deficits affect our ability to communicate and engage socially and uh, have been shown to have negative consequences for our mental health. Social distancing during COVID has exacerbated these challenges. Uh, the question that we sought to address was whether various forms of digital communication, and in this presentation with a focus on video calls, could protect against depression related to sensory impairment uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. Uh, in this study, we use data from round three of NSHAP as well as the COVID sub-study. Hearing and vision were measured in 2015 by interviewer rating. Uh, and olfaction was measured by uh, an objective measure, odor identification. We included olfaction as a negative control because in contrast to hearing and vision, we did not expect olfaction to influence the usability of digital devices and thus have no effect on mental health through that avenue. Um, we also looked at the frequency of uh, social contact during COVID, um, in particular video calls. Uh, and our outcome variable was self-reported feelings of depression with higher scores indicating more frequent feelings of depression. Uh, next slide. Our first result was that Older adults with vision and hearing impairment were less likely to video call frequently. Uh, this first graph shows frequency of video calling broken down by presence or absence of uh, vision, hearing, and olfaction impairment. Older adults with vision and hearing impairment use video calling less compared to those without sensory impairment. And this was not seen for olfaction. And nor was this pattern seen for other forms of communication, including phone calls and video, uh, oh, sorry, and in-person visits. So it's limited to um, video calling. Next slide. Uh, and this graph shows the odds ratios for uh, difference in communication when controlling for baseline depression in 2015, baseline internet use, which we use as a proxy for familiarity with digital devices, as well as other uh, sociodemographic factors. And here we see that the association we saw on the last slide uh, held up after controlling for these potential confounders. Um, and specifically, older adults of vision and hearing were about half as likely to engage in video calling frequently compared to those without those impairments. Next slide. Uh, next, we looked at how video calling affected the relationship between sensory impairment and depression. And so this graph shows the fitted model 
of a linear regression with interaction term between vision impairment and depression. So each line represents a different frequency of video calls. And we wanted to see at each level of video calling, never weekly, daily frequencies, what was the relationship between vision and depression? And so for those who never used video calling, represented by the lightest colored line, vision impairment was positively associated with depression, as we expected. However, as frequency of video calling increased from never to weekly to daily, the slope of the line uh, flattens out and becomes negative, uh, indicating more frequent video calls attenuated the effect that vision impairment had on depression. Next slide. And we obtained a similar result for our hearing. Video calling mitigated the effect that hearing impairment had on depression. And as expected, we did not find a significant relationship for olfaction or negative control. Next slide. So in conclusion, we found that video calls, video calls mitigated the effect, uh, mitigated depression associated with vision and hearing impairment during COVID. At the same time, those people with worse vision and hearing were less likely to be using video calls in the first place. Promoting video calls and increasing its accessibility through methods like screen readers, dictation, connecting to hearing aids, may be a strategy to protect mental health for this group. And finally, with smartphone use becoming more and more common in older adults, uh, just in 2021, 70% of adults over 70 reported having a smartphone. Digital devices may be an important avenue for delivering social interventions in our current pandemic and future contexts as well. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Spots, should we just carry on to the next panel? Yes. Yeah, so I let me, uh, it'll be Dr. Takwi, Wait, Choi, Riley, Piedra, and Hal. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Dr. Wait, would you like to back one slide, please? Um, Dr. Wait will just quickly overview for any new people in the group what sample we're talking about here. So the, um, all the presentations that follow um, use the NSHAP COVID substudy, which as Dr. Hockley um, told you earlier, was field, fielded early in the pandemic. A feature of the study is our ability to compare people's well-being on many dimensions in 2015, 16, before the pandemic to their experience in the um, early phases of the pandemic. So we can isolate change. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. The first presentation, one more, is given by Juan Choi. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, today I will talk about social isolation and worsening health behaviors during COVID-19. Next slide, please. Social isolation is a risk factor for reduced health and poor health behaviors. And limited contact with others is a central or key indicator of social isolation. Recent findings show that COVID particularly affected in-person contact, but not so much other remote modes of contact. And this is not surprising given social distancing measures led many people to stay at home. In this context, our study defined social isolation during COVID as infrequent in-person social contact and perceptions of decrease in in-person social contact compared with pre-pandemic. Next slide, please. In our study, we ask, is social isolation during COVID associated with poor health behaviors and worsening of health behaviors? Next slide, please. 
And here's an overview of all the measures we use in our study. On the left are our explanatory variables. We have a total of four explanatory variables, infrequent in-person contact with family and friends, and perceived decrease in in-person contact with family and friends. And the middle column shows our outcome variables. Uh, we have a total of eight outcome variables, the first four of which are poor health behaviors during COVID, and the other four are perceived worsening of health behaviors since COVID started. And I'll explain these measures in more detail in the following slides. Next slide, please. Infrequent in-person contact was measured using questions asking about the current in-person contact frequency with family members and friends separately. And we defined infrequent in-person contact as having in-person visits less than once a week or never having in-person visits. For each of the two questions about current in-person contact frequency, a follow-up question asked whether this is more or less compared with pre-pandemic. And reporting a little less often and a lot less often to this question was defined as perceiving a decrease in in-person contact. Next slide, please. And moving on to our outcome measures, um, the sub-study contained questions about current health behaviors. We use this information and existing guidelines to define low physical activity, heavy drinking, current smoking, and poor sleep quality. And for each of the four questions about current health behavior, a follow-up question was asked whether this is more, less, or about the same compared with pre-pandemic. And using the response to this question, we generated reduced physical activity, increased drinking, increased smoking, and feeling less rested after sleep as measures of perceived worsening of health behaviors. Next slide, please. Uh, getting into our results, uh, because all our outcome measures are dichotomous, we estimated logistic regression models. Um, and the first health behavior is physical activity. As you can see from the figure on the left, in-person contact was not associated with low physical activity. On the other hand, as you can see from the figure on the right, perceived decrease in in-person contact was associated with higher odds of perceiving reduced physical activity. Next slide. And we find a similar pattern when we examine drinking. Perceived decrease in in-person contact was associated with higher odds of perceiving increased drinking. Next slide. The pattern is different when we look at smoking. Infrequent in-person contact with family was associated with higher odds of perceiving increased smoking. Next slide, please. And finally, turning to sleep, we see a similar pattern as we saw for physical activity and drinking. Perceived decrease in in-person contact is associated with higher odds of feeling less rested after sleep. Next slide. And to sum, um, summarize our findings, social isolation is measured by infrequent in-person contact or perceived decline in person contact were not, was not associated with poor health behaviors. On the other hand, we found that perceived decrease in in-person contact was associated with perceived worsening of health behaviors, except for increased smoking. And this wasn't included in the slides, but we also found that loneliness mediated some of this relationship. Next slide. Our findings highlight the importance of in-person social contact. Recent studies have shown that in-person contact has benefits for older adults' emotional well-being during the pandemic. Our results also point to the benefits of in-person contact on older adults' health behaviors. Also, our findings suggest that self-perceived changes can be useful in capturing older adults' well-being during the pandemic. Subjective measures may be more important than objective measures as these measures in part reflect feelings of disruption caused by COVID. Thank you. Next slide, please. The next presentation is, will be given by Lizette Piedra. Hello, I'm delighted to present on Latinos in the pandemic. Um, these findings were published in the Journal of Applied Gerontology. Next slide, please. 
Next slide. Okay, thank you. Pre-pandemic factors place Latinos at higher risk. They are more likely to, they are three times more likely to get COVID-19 and twice as likely to die from the virus. Latinos disproportionately live in dense neighborhoods and large households, which poses barriers to social distancing. They are more than twice as likely to live in a multi-generational household and four times as likely to live with their grandchildren than non-Latino whites. Next slide, please. They are overrepresented among essential workers. Only 16% of Latinos reported being able to work from home compared to 31% of non-Latino whites. Next slide, please. Pre-pandemic um, economic hardships among Latinos are well-documented. 61% reported a job or an income loss in the household. 46% um, reported material hardship, the inability to pay rent, mortgage, utilities, ongoing food insecurity, unmet medical needs. Um, and these disparities compared to non-Latino whites. Um, and these disparities are further accentuated among the foreign born um, because many immigrants and those living within mixed status households, um, because these immigrants may not necessarily qualify for federal pandemic relief or safety net programs. Um, because people tend to associate with others who share their ethnicity, religion, education, occupation, this affiliative dynamic tends to reinforce the concentration of disadvantage for those who are already underprivileged, which means that for populations where disadvantage converges along racial and ethnic lines, um, we can expect to see a disproportionate pandemic-related outcomes. Next slide, please. Before the pandemic, 90% of Latinos reported having enough income to meet basic needs, and 60% um, were working compared to non-Latino whites, 50%. Um, next slide, please. Since the pandemic, more Latinos reported being worse off in their ability to meet basic needs compared to their non-Latino white counterparts. More employed Latinos experienced the COVID-related changes in their work. More reported being worse off in their ability to meet basic needs. They had less weekly contact with family and friends than non-Latino whites. However, Latinos were more likely to receive outside help with tasks than non-Latino whites. Next slide, please. Compared to non-Latino white, um, Latino participants um, are younger, foreign born, Spanish speaking, and had less education. More than a third had less than a high school education. Next slide, please. When we compare this sample to Latinos in the NSHEP round three sample, we find that the, our Latino sample participants had higher levels of education, better celebrated health, and higher household income. Important factor, uh, fact to keep in mind. Next slide, please. We used as an outcome variable whether a doctor or health provider had diagnosed the person, spouse, uh, partner, someone in the household, a family friend, or an acquaintance with a COVID-19 diagnosis. Next slide. Um, we use three, in, um, for independent variables, we use three exposure factors, the size of the household, reliance on outside health, and experience in work change, um, and whether the pandemic had affected their ability to meet um, their, their basic expenses and pay bills. Next slide, please. We hypothesize that these exposure factors and material hardship would possibly be associated with the COVID-19 diagnosis. Next slide, please. Um, you can see on this table that at every level, um, self, household member, um, outside the household and acquaintances, Latinos are overrepresented with the, with the COVID-19 diagnosis. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, this table displays the odds ratio for the association between household size, task help, work change, material hardship, and a COVID-19 diagnosis. Although not shown, task help in Model 4 and material hardship in Model 5 were significantly associated with a COVID-19 diagnosis within a household. In Model 6, we included both variables, and in Model 7, we removed non-significant exposure variables. Both models revealed material hardship had a significant and large association with household COVID um, diagnosis. Next slide, please. This figure displays the probabilistic predictions of a COVID-19 diagnosis within the household by material hardship 
during the pandemic, Model 7. Latino respondents reported being worse off financially during the pandemic were 10 percentage points more likely to report a COVID-19 diagnosis within their household than those who were financially better off or the same. Um, in contrast, non-Latino whites experiencing material hardship were five percentage points more likely to report a COVID-19 diagnosis. Next slide, please. The implications. Older adults were disproportionately affected, um, and this was linked to pre-pandemic disadvantage. Material hardship and reliance on outside help emerged as the two most significant correlates, making, um, we, we speculate that um, this made social distancing difficult and encouraged contact with an informal economic um, economy. Um, a note on our, our limitations. We had limited general generalizability um, because the samples look different from round three to, to the COVID, but um, our, our comparison suggests that these findings that our findings might be understatement, understated material hardship and the need for outside help likely heightened vulnerability um, to a greater degree than our findings actually reflect. We also had no way of knowing um, whether you know, what someone's citizenship status was or whether they lived in a household, a mixed household. Um, these factors coincide with worse material hardship during the pandemic. And finally, um, we were, although we tested for mortality, the small numbers of COVID deaths um, precluded our ability to draw conclusions. However, we did note similar trends for those who knew somebody who died of COVID and those who experienced a COVID diagnosis in the household. And these analyses are available upon request. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. The next um, presentation is by Alicia Riley. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity to present about this work on unequal loss during the pandemic. Next slide. So I want to shift to focus on the toll of pandemic of the pandemic on bereavement. Racial and ethnic disparities in COVID mortality are well documented at this point, but disparities in COVID bereavement may be even more extreme because of the ways that deaths cluster in social networks. This is concerning because the risk of prolonged grief disorder and complicated grief may be higher for pandemic bereaved adults due to the traumas associated with many COVID deaths. Next slide, please. Much of what we know thus far about social disparities in COVID death come from analyses of surveillance data. But surveillance data is rarely disaggregated beyond sex, age, place, and race ethnicity, obscuring the role of intersecting social factors such as language. Also, surveillance data can't reveal the clustering of COVID mortality in social networks. Next, please. This is where survey data like the NSHEP COVID sub-study are important. So mindful of this in intersectionality of race, ethnicity, and language, I constructed a categorical variable that accounts for the major racial ethnic language groups represented in the NSHEP sample. And this was the exposure variable for this study. I used it to ask, are there race, ethnicity by language differences in social network proximity to a COVID death? The outcome here, social network proximity or closeness to a COVID death was measured using this simple question, have any of the following people died of COVID? And then possible network members are listed. And I constructed a dichotomous version and an ordinal version of this measure. The ordinal version ranked closeness to someone who died of COVID from an acquaintance all the way up to a spouse. And today I'll focus on pretty simple descriptive results and just mention some brief findings from some regression analyses. Next, please. Non-Hispanic whites are the majority of our COVID substudy sample at 73%. And overall, the prevalence of loss of a close social network member was low. So when I show you the next results, keep in mind that these are rare events. Next, please. In this slide and the following slides, the bar furthest to the left shows the full sample for each race, ethnicity by language subgroup. So here we're looking at the um, that 73% of the sample that's white. And with each bar to the right, the sample is restricted based on increasing proximity to a COVID death. So now we only have those who lost an acquaintance to COVID and then those who lost a family or friend and then a household member and then finally a spouse. 
So what you see here for non-Hispanic whites is as the sample is restricted based on closeness to a COVID death, it becomes less and less white. And in fact, not a single one of our 1,800 and something white respondents lost a household member or spouse to COVID. Next, please. Non-Hispanic Black English-speaking respondents were 13% of the sample, but you can see as we move to the right, they're overrepresented in every category of closeness to a COVID death. Disturbingly, the proportion in Black is three times higher among respondents who lost a household member to COVID than in the full sample. Next, please. Now we have English-speaking Latino people of any race. While this group is only 5% of the full sample, you see that their representation jumps to twice as high among respondents who lost a family or friend to COVID, four times as high among those who lost a household member to COVID, and five times as high among those who lost a spouse to COVID. Next, please. Finally, here's the pattern for Spanish-speaking older adults of any race. While Spanish-speaking respondents were only 4.6% of the full sample, half of the respondents who lost a spouse to COVID-19 were Spanish speakers. Next, please. Logistic regressions indicate that um, non-Hispanic Black older adults were three times more likely to have lost anyone that they knew to COVID. Spanish speakers in that same model were eight times more likely to have known someone who died of COVID at the time of the study, and this was controlling for age, sex, marital status, and education. Next, please. So I, it's a simple descriptive result, but I think it's powerful because it shows that attention to race by language subgroups reveals substantial disparities in pandemic bereavement that we would miss otherwise. Spanish speaking older adults were far more likely to lose a close social network member. And there's a potential for accelerated health declines among Spanish speakers due to complicated grief, loss of a caregiver, and so much more. I wanna acknowledge quickly limitations Many respondents were surveyed prior to the winter surge, so surely these disparities have shifted since the vaccine period. Also, there's a big limitation that we can't disentangle language from nativity. The dramatic overrepresentation of Spanish speaking respondents as closeness to a COVID death increased could reflect higher COVID deaths in communities of Spanish speaking immigrants in the US which of course stem from deep systemic vulnerabilities, exclusion, and language barriers. It could also reflect variation in network structure, including transnational connections to relatives in other countries. It's clear that we need better frameworks for understanding these intersecting influences on Latino health and immigrant health, including thinking about how structural disadvantage concentrates within social networks. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. The next presentation will be get, given by Connie Svob. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm presenting on uh, behalf of Dr. Connie Svob. The topic is uh, religious audacity and substance use among Black and Hispanic Americans during the COVID-19 pandemic in New York City. Next slide, please. Um, the study found that religious people had a lower prevalence of drinking alcohol, marijuana, or other drug use compared to other religious people. Non-religious people, I'm sorry. <laughs> Next, please. From its start in 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately impacted the historically marginalized groups, particularly in the United States. Black and Hispanic Americans, for example, experienced substantially high rates of infection, hospitalization, and deaths from COVID-19 compared to non-Hispanic white Americans. Religion has historically played a prominent role in the lives of Americans, especially so for Blacks and Hispanics, and has been associated with better health outcomes. Next slides, please. The purpose of the study was to investigate associations between personal religiosity 
and substance use among Blacks and Hispanic Americans in the initial COVID-19 Epic Center, New York City, during the first six months of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Phone interviews were conducted with adults who self-reported race, ethnicity as non-Hispanic Black, African-American, or Hispanic. Participants responded to how religious they were, very somewhat, not at all, and on their current alcohol and drug use, yes or no. Next slide, please. Uh, there was a significant uh, cross-sectional association of religiosity with substance use. From this table, we can see religious people, those reporting to be somewhat or very religious had a lower prevalence of drinking alcohol, 49%, compared to non-religious people, 67.1%. Religious people also had substantially lower prevalence of marijuana or other drug use, 9%, compared to non-religious group, 31%. This association remained statistically significant after adjusting for age, gender, race, ethnicity, and household income. Next slides, please. Personal religiosity may be important in reducing substance use, even in the absence of religious services and in-person congregational supports. Socially marginalized groups during the COVID-19 pandemic may be added by religious supports for those who are religious. Moreover, the findings suggest that religiosity might in itself that be helpful from a public health perspective, independent of serving as a conduit for other social services. Further study, especially in-depth longitudinal examination of religious factors, such as prayer, access to online religious services is warranted. Thank you. Next slide is the information of Dr. Thank you so much. Uh, the next presenter will be uh, Drs. Ansel and McReynolds. Dr. McReynolds, you're muted. You're still muted. Hold on a second. There we go. I think we're okay now. Okay. Thank no. you very okay, much. There we go. Yep. Sorry. Um, great. Thank you, Susan, um, and for presenting some of the work by Connie, who's also a member of our global psychopathy group here at Columbia University. Um, I'm going to, this is like almost a continuation of some other analyses that Dr. Ansel presented on yesterday in our um, college, uh, U.S. college sample of students and looking at the impact of the many aspects of the pandemic on the health and well-being of college students. As um, Dr. Gordon uh, mentioned at the top of the hour that, uh, you know, there's been great associations, significant associations with depression and anxiety in the general population, but this has also been quite an issue for college students who prior to the pandemic had much higher elevated rates of depression and anxiety with uh, suicide being the second leading cause, cause of death for this age group. So we think about why this might happen. Um, college life itself and the transition during emerging adulthood is really an encompassing of many different aspects of life from personal and social identity growth to um, economic independence, um, and vocational and professional development. 
So what the, you know, when along comes the pandemic and puts up in many of those kind of traditional paths or, or making those uh, ad emerging adult um, milestones. So one thing that we um, were very interested in looking at is that intolerance of uncertainty, which has been long established to be associated with depression and anxiety, um, really impacts one's ability to plan and act upon future plans. Um, and so we were very interested to see, well, and along the same lines, intolerance of uncertainty has been associated with really one's ability to cope with adversity. So as many others earlier um, in today's presentations have mentioned, the secondary consequence of the pandemic has been financial hardship. Oh, uh, yes, right now we're just seeing the title slide right now. But um, so we were also interested in how the intersection between uh, intolerance of uncertainty is also associated with um, one's ability to cope with COVID related financial impact. So just as some backdrop on the sample, we did a very uh, comprehensive online assessment, um, as many did in early pandemic. And we took a range of experiences from actual you know, virus-related exposures and um, health-related uh, changes in their academic transitions, changes to daily life and support, uh, screen time is one, and internet use that we'll talk about later. Um, and also, as I mentioned, the changes or impact on their employment and finances. So along with the other main section is talking about an array of health, um, uh, health outcomes and status. One of the, the two that we'll talk about today is depression and anxiety. But really what we felt was a value added um, to the, the orientation of the impact of the, of the pandemic on this age group was thinking about how it is influencing their decision-making style and values. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So given that a very comprehensive assessment, I'll um, just give some backdrop on how we went about recruiting our sample as well as the, the study design itself. So very uh, briefly, we initially uh, outreach to uh, for the use of our, um, ac our academic partners, the American Association of Colleges and Universities, to contact um, key stakeholders at those universities to spread the word about our survey. But quickly, um, uh, in hindsight, 2020, they were very preoccupied at that time, moving everyone off their campuses and whatnot. So we went more to a direct um, to consumer uh, recruitment via social media on Instagram. And very, you know, we had a whole line of uh, HIPAA authorization and rules, but we also probably like um, uh, other studies of this age group that were out there, we knew we particularly wanted to be asking about suicidality um, and, and asking about recency of, uh, of those behaviors. So that implored that we set up a direct uh, outreach with the National Crisis Center to do a proactive follow-up of students. Um, who were informed that they would be contacted in the event they did report imminent suicidality. So students were um, could take the survey anonymously. Um, oddly enough, many chose to directly uh, give information. And um, when they did so, we uh, told them that they could enter into a lottery. The next slide. So our survey participants were largely, my most online survey um, were female, about 80% female, about 53% white. We had a nice distribution of the, the range of uh, class academic years who participated. Um, we also, uh, which I think is unique than other more single university or samples, we had a 20% community college sample um, or participants. A majority were full-time students at the time in, in March of 2020. Um, we had over 60% said that they're more than happy to follow up for um, future surveys. And even so, it was a very probably expensive survey than the other five to 10 minute ones that they were taking at the time. Uh, we had a 43% 100% uh, completion rate of the entire survey. The next slide. So we employed um, the Intolerance of Uncertainty 12 scale. It's a very common scale that's been around in use, and it allows 
uh, participants to rank on a, um, uh, a Likert one to five of how much do these uh, items resemble themselves as you know, one being not characteristic to five being entirely characteristic. So this subscale is made up of two, um, the scale is made up of two subscales. There's the inhibitory anxiety, which really contains items that are uh, related to avoidance and paralysis when faced with uncertainty. So it's items like the smallest doubt can stop me from acting. I must get away from all uncertain situations. The perspective anxiety subscale uh, has items that are more like I can't stand being taken by surprise, um, engagement. Uh, it's really about unforeseen events upset me greatly. Um, sorry, there's some background noise, but. Um, so we had a real interest of looking at how these related to other things of adversity. Next slide, please. So as a measure of financial hardship, we had a whole section of the survey, a module, that really asked about things they were experiencing now, um, either they or their family or their parents or guardians um, related to the pandemic. So of 13 different items we asked about, it ranged from self had, self had lost jobs, or that the um, that their parents had lost or reduced hours of employment, and overall, if anyone had endorsed meeting any one of these items, they were considered to have been experiencing some COVID-related financial hardship. So around 67 percent. Next slide. So what I'll get to in a minute. Another major area related to. Um, the government mitigation issues and other, uh, you know, related to school closures, social distancing, um, uh, that also really tax college students um, and likely, and likely reinforced or redirected existing coping skills was one area of this age group and this generation's use is uh, social media, internet use. So one of the areas, and we conceptualized this in, in two, uh, operationalized it in two ways. So average daily screen time, so that could be any type of information gathering for an average of less than four hours versus four more hours. And then there was also the change in their social media use. So that would be change in social media, Facebook, TikTok, um, WhatsApp, and, and Snapchat. So we said, we asked them to uh, report of whether it had increased, decreased, or stayed about the same as before March. So next. So these are two sets of um, complementary analyses. One is predicting moderate to severe depression, and the other is reporting moderate to severe anxiety. And we originally hypothesized that one's intolerance of uncertainty might mediate the exposure to COVID-related financial hardship in the mental, each of these mental health outcomes. But what we found for both depression and anxiety is that each of them exhibited an independent association and actually a quite strong association with, the, um, with both depression and outcome. Next slide, please. So in conclusion for that set of analyses is that the results support the idea that an individual's tolerance of uncertainty is protective of their mental health outcomes and is just as important to consider as actually exposure to adversities themselves, such as here represented by um, COVID-related financial hardship, where usually the most of attention goes. So implications for this is college administrators should consider both of these to be actually powerful, important aspects of the mental health outcomes. And that should uh, equally be addressed when strengthening students' um, uh, coping capacity. Next slide, please. So and these are analyses that are predicting depression and anxiety as it relates to this internet use uh, operationalized two ways as just how much time they're on the internet, um, whether it be for information gathering, emotional you know, seeking or information about the pandemic versus one which is a more a, a social uh, utilization of the, of the internet. So here, when we look at um, the last two call and the last couple rows, is that we find that there's a difference between the two ways these are operationalized. 
average daily screen time, just being on uh, many an average of four more hours a day was associated with the increased risk for depression, but not so for anxiety. But however, when we operationalized it as change in social media use, meaning the Facebook, the TikTok, the Snapchat, is that it's associated with um, the increase in that use is associated with um, increased risk for both depression and anxiety, about one and a half times. Next. So implications or conclusion to draw from these analyses that look at the connection between two different forms of internet use and, uh, and mental health is that they you know, differentially associated just the a, a amount of time online versus the utilization of that use, meaning social media. And the results seem to challenge this notion that online activity replaces in-person socialization as a promoter of positive mental health. And I think this uh, you know, kind of echoes what uh, one said earlier in a presentation is that it's not, it seems to not be a, a, an exact replacement for the inner, you know, connected uh, piece. So findings um, indicate that challenges, uh, excuse me, that changes is an online behavior during COVID uh, may be a stronger indicator of the overall mental health issues versus the steady state use. And this is even for an age group where, where internet social media use is really central to their, to their lives um, in their daily lives. But it also kind of reminds you of a harken of any change in behavior seems to always reflect or be a uh, put one at, at risk um, for a negative outcome. So academic administrators should be really be more aware of students' uh, social media use and its consequences. Um, they may have thoughts about developing um, as a means of outreach to students during these times to promote um, either improve the interventions they have in place um, or as well as promote resilience among college students. Next slide. So, and again, um, all of this work could not be um, uh, at all possible without the tremendous efforts of our global psych epi team here, Christina um, Hoven, our director, George Musa, um, the deputy director, as well as the plethora of uh, team members and students throughout the pandemic to help develop the survey, bench test it, get it out there, collect it, as well as our academic and um, uh, kind of collegiate related partners who at the American Association of Colleges and Universities, as well as the National Education Association, Active Minds, the Jed Foundation, the NCAA, as well as um, other uh, health organizations that were very concerned with addressing the um, emotional health and well-being needs of uh, college students during during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our final talk in the session will be um, from Dr. John. Thank you. So uh, I'm presenting our work on relationship quality changes among partnered older adults during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically changed social life, especially during the early months. There were transitions to remote work and school, the practice of social distancing, and the reduction of social contact with people outside the household. Given this massive confinement of social life to the home sphere, it is likely that for many people, romantic partners became a major source or the only source of face-to-face -face social interaction during this time. Next slide, please. Yet we know little about whether and how these intimate relationships were affected by the increased reliance on these bonds during the pandemic. For instance, did this lead to more time spent together between couples, thereby enhancing relationship quality, or did the stresses of the pandemic and the increased time together lead to more friction between romantic partners? For instance, more fights and disagreements about changes in economic circumstances or how to protect the household from COVID-19. Because high quality intimate relationships are key resources for older adults' physical and emotional health, our study explores whether the pandemic changed relationship quality among partnered older adults, whether different socio-demographic groups experience changes in relationship quality in different ways, and whether existing vulnerabilities and access to coping resources shaped how different socio-demographic groups experience changes in relationship quality. Next slide, please. 
So we draw on the vulnerability stress adaptation model of marital quality to form a hypothesis. This model proposes that relationship quality depends on one, how much stress a couple encounters, two, the enduring vulnerabilities partners bring to the romantic unit, and three, how well partners adapt to stressors and vulnerabilities. The COVID-19 pandemic is a major stressor that could potentially worsen relationship quality, or alternatively, it could have created opportunities for couples to adapt together, thereby improving relationship quality. So we propose two complete competing hypotheses among other hypotheses. Next slide, please. Um, so hypothesis 1A states that older adults are more likely to report worsening relationship quality during the pandemic compared to before it. And hypothesis uh, 1B states that older adults are more likely to report improving relationship quality during the pandemic compared to before it. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated inequalities between different socio-demographic groups. For instance, reduced social contact with friends and family may have had more of an impact on women's relationship quality than men's. And women may have taken on more care work and housework during the pandemic, leading to more stresses for them. Racial minorities are shouldering a larger burden of COVID-19 cases and deaths, job losses and financial security, uh, and discrimination. Because of these additional stressors that minority groups face, we propose hypothesis two. Socially disadvantaged groups are more likely to report worsening relationship quality and are less likely to report improving relationship quality during the pandemic. Because some groups have fewer financial and psychosocial resources to buffer the stresses of the pandemic and its impact on relationship quality, while others are more vulnerable to the stresses of the pandemic, such as those with poor health or have children in the household, all of which could strain uh, the relationship, we, put, we also propose hypothesis three. Sociodemographic differences in the likelihood of reporting worsening and or improving relationship quality during the pandemic may be partially explained by vulnerability of risk factors and financial and psychosocial resources. Next slide, please. So to test our hypothesis, uh, we use data from the National Social Life and Health um, and Aging, uh, sorry, the NSHAP COVID-19 uh, study, which has been described extensively in earlier uh, presentations, so I'll skip um, that. But for our present uh, study, we restricted our analyses to 1,642 partnered older adults who are age 50 and older. And to assess changes in relationship quality during the pandemic, respondents were asked compared to before the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, would you say your relationship quality with your partner has gotten a lot better, gotten a little better, stay the same, gotten a little worse, or gotten a lot worse? We combined a lot better with a little better and a lot worse with a little worse into a three category outcome variable, which stayed the same as a reference category. We first calculated the proportion of partnered older adults who reported changes in their relationship quality, and then used multinomial logistic regression analyses to estimate the likelihood of reporting improved, unchanged, or worsened relationship quality during the pandemic. Next slide, please. We found that 67% of partnered older adults reported that their relationship quality stayed the same during the pandemic, and another 22.4% reported that their relationship quality got better, and only 10.5% said their relationship quality got worse. These results partially support hypothesis 1B, that older adults are more likely to report improving relationship quality during the pandemic compared to before it. Next slide, please. These are results from our multinomial logistic regression analyses. This model only contains our sociodemographic variables. And these results show that consistent with hypothesis two, women are 30% less likely than men to report that their relationship quality got better. And respondents aged 80 and older are 70% less likely than respondents younger than 60 to report improved relationship quality during the pandemic. Contrary to hypothesis two, however, black respondents are more likely than white respondents to report that their relationship quality got better during the pandemic and educational attainment and marital status were unrelated to relationship quality change during the pandemic, despite hypothesis two predictions. Interestingly, there are no sociodemographic factors that are associated with reporting that relationship quality got worse during the pandemic, just whether respondents were more or less likely to report that relationship quality improved. Next slide, please. Sorry, uh, can you go back? 
Yeah, uh, so model two includes our financial and psychosocial resources that may mediate the relationship between sociodemographic factors and relationship quality change. Model two shows that in contrast to hypothesis three, neither the vulnerabilities of poor health and living with children or financial and psychosocial resources explain the age and gender findings in model one. While estimates from nonlinear models are not straightforwardly comparable across models with different covariates, we noticed some findings of interest. Controlling for financial and psychosocial resources reveals additional associations between relationship quality change and sociodemographic characteristics uh, that actually contradict our hypotheses. While we initially hypothesized uh, hypothesize that in general, older adults with more resources would be better able to protect their relationship quality during the pandemic, we found that in contrast to this expectation, those with a college degree or more have nearly three times the risk of reporting worsening relationship quality during the pandemic compared to those with less than a high school degree. Other resources, however, did protect relationship quality in the way we expected. Better mental health was associated with a lower risk of reporting worsening relationship quality. And as, respect, uh, as expected, those who became financially better off are more likely to report relationship quality got better, whereas those who became financially worse off are more likely to report that relationship quality got worse. Those receiving tangible help less often during the pandemic are also more likely to report worsening relationship quality. And interestingly, older adults receiving social support more often during the pandemic are more likely to both report improved and worsened relationship quality. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 pandemic is a major stressor that could change relationship quality for older adults, which could have implications for individuals' mental and physical health down the line. What we found was actually quite encouraging. Most partnered older adults experienced relationship quality, stability and only a minority experienced a decline in relationship quality during this time. And close to a quarter of older adults reported that their relationship quality got better during the pandemic. We aren't able to test the reasons for the improvement in relationship quality, but we think that perhaps the pandemic may have increased the time couples spend together or presented an opportunity for couples to show mutual support in the face of an external challenge or may have prompted individuals to prioritize their relationships. Although many older adults enjoyed either stable or improved relationship quality during this time, the benefits are not equally distributed. Women and the oldest old were less likely to report improved relationship quality than men and those under 60. We don't have the data to explain to explore why this is the case. Perhaps it may be because women increased their risk management behaviors to support their loved ones health during the pandemic or took on more emotional, cognitive and household labor during this time. Whereas for the oldest old, we know that relationship quality is more likely to decline with age. Nevertheless, we feel that resilience best describes partnered older adults' experiences during the first year of the pandemic. Even as older adults are perhaps the most vulnerable to pandemic-related health risks and changes to social life, partnered older adults may have strong emotional resources to protect their relationships. Although we were able to describe changes in relationship quality during the COVID-19 pandemic and how this varied across sociodemographic groups, our data did not allow us to explore the mechanisms behind these changes. We are currently unable to assess why Black respondents were more likely to experience improved relationship quality and why women and the oldest old were less likely to report improved relationship quality. However, NCHEF is currently collecting a fourth round of data, and we hope that once these data become available, we can examine how the pandemic imp uh, impacted relationship quality. And in our future research, we plan to explore whether it changes in partnered activity, time spent together, partner support and partner strain can explain these changes in relationship quality. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to remind everyone that they can um, put their questions in the chat. Um, there's been some discussion in the chat already. Um, so some questions have been answered, but we'll see what we've got here. Um, so this question was directed to one of the earlier NSHAP talks. I apologize for not quite recalling who gave the talk, but there's a question about the sample size for drinkers and smokers being smaller than the whole sample. Could there be something about their mental health that differs overall independent from COVID? And I'm hoping that the NSHAP researcher um, who can answer that recognizes themselves. Thanks. Uh, so I think the question was directed to me. Can I, and I actually put down the answer in the chat, but I can say it. Uh, I apologize, I missed oh, that. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Go ahead. 
And so, no, we didn't look at um, the mental health of smokers and drinkers. And I, I definitely did, uh, I did look at it really quickly. Um, and no, there aren't any differences in, in mental health between smokers and non-smokers and drinkers and non-drinkers. Um, but we, what we did was a mediation analysis to see if emotional well-being measures, including loneliness, anxiety, and depressive feelings, uh, mediates the link between decreased in-person contact and worsening health behaviors, and, and found that loneliness mediates some of this relationship. And, and thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Um, this is for Dr. McReynolds. How do you see intolerance and uncertainty as related to resilience, if you see a connection at all? Is tolerance of uncertainty a learned skill? Right, um, and I think I also answered this in the, in the oh, chat, but oh, definitely- yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay, there is an association between the two in, in the sense that the intolerance of uncertainty can impact one's ability to plan you know, and make future plans and act on them which some of those plans may be um, uh, activities to promote um, resiliency, um, so definitely. But then also, and this was one of our original uh, interests in looking at different types of decision-making styles in, um, in, this, in this group during the, the pandemic is that yes, there are interventions that have been established to address one's intolerance of uncertainty. And so, in, and then in turn promote uh, better mental health outcomes. Well, I don't know if Dr. Ansel has another uh, comment on that topic. Uh, no, I, I think that that you know that very thoroughly uh, covered it. Um, I think you you know your point is um, uh, Larkin is very well taken that when when someone is intolerant of uncertainty, it it tends to paralyze them in terms of their decision making, um, and and, and um, you know, rather than be able to consider um, the, the different kinds of outcomes, uh, the intolerance of that uncertainty tends to um, disallow people from making any kind of decision. And then also earlier research has shown when they do make a decision, they will tend to make a suboptimal decision um, because that suboptimal decision is kind of risk avoidance and it could be too much of risk avoidance. Um, so people might, uh, might err on the side of uh, overly safe actions. Um, all of those, um, can Im impact uh, long-term uh, well-being, especially for uh, college students who are making lifelong plans. Thank you. So here is what I know has not been answered. Um, did NSHAP data set, did the NSHAP data set include any Asian older adults? If not, is there any plan to sample this group? And is it an all English speaking sample? Um, either Linda or I could answer that. I will tell you that we have Asians in the sample, but we did not sample for inclusion of Asians and do not have any immediate plans to do so. Um, we do not have an only English speaking sample. There are Spanish speaking respondents and um, we haven't, didn't talk about that in the data, but there are ways of identifying who received a Spanish interview as opposed to an English language interview. Does that answer the question, Hera? It, it seems like it does. I'm, I'm hoping that if um, the um, asker has a follow-up, they'll put that in the chat. Um, and I, I do not see any other questions that have not been asked. Do any of the presenters have questions of each other? And if not, that's fine too. Yeah. Dr. Sales question. Um, I'll answer this next one, the age range in NCHAP. Um, that was uh, initially when we started in 2005, these were people born between 1920 and 47. So they were 57 to 85 years old at onset. And when we brought in the new cohort of baby boomers in 2015, we started them a little bit younger. They were age 50 to 67. So take that to 20. 22 and how old we've got the oldest ones now being 95 plus um, down to 55, 56 plus. The partners in some cases are younger, but if we're doing analyses and we want to deal with the older adults, we will age delimit the, the analyses to the older adults. Linda, do you want to add anything to that? No, that was, that was very clear. 
we don't have, we know who the Asian respondents are, but as we didn't oversample, it's a small sample and I'm not sure even within uh, categories, we know whether somebody's South Asian or Southeast Asian. Uh, we do know um, where they were born, uh, either state of birth or country of origin if they immigrated. That helps a little. Thank you. Are there any other questions from anyone? We're, this was a remarkably efficient um, set of talks. So we're running actually ahead of time, which is really unprecedented. Um, but if there are no more questions, um, we do have a break until 1.50 this afternoon um, before our session on um, disadvantaged populations, which should be quite interesting. So um, I think we can um, take an early break um, go get some lunch if it is that time where you are. Um, and, um, and we'll see you back here at 150. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back everyone from break. Um, I'll turn this over to Deborah Duran to get our next session started. Thank you. Um, as Erica said, welcome back. Our session now is the disadvantaged populations. Deborah, we don't seem to be able to hear you. Oh. I could hear. Never mind. You're fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, we have a, a full agenda, and so we'll start the presentations with, um, and uh, to all the presenters, I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, we're going to start with health care use and outcomes among older adults enrolled in North Carolina Medicaid during the COVID-19 pandemic by um, Dr. Kate. Um, Bundorf from Duke University. Kate? Okay. Great start on uh, name pronunciation. <laughs> so are my, can other folks? Oh, there we go. Yes, go okay. Um, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to present our results here. This is a project looking at healthcare use and outcomes among older adults enrolled in, enrolled in North Carolina Medicaid during the COVID-19 pandemic. My collaborators are Ristana Kaufman, Mark McClellan, Courtney Van Hopen, and Avi Giri, uh, all of Duke University. Of course, we thank NIH for funding, um, as well as the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services uh, for providing access to the data that we'll be using. Uh, next slide, please. So the objective of our project is basically to uh, determine the impact of the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic on the healthcare use and outcomes of medically complex older adults. We were particularly interested in this population because it became you know, clear in the, in the beginning of the pandemic that outcomes conditional on having COVID were um, worse or folks were at higher risk for a poor outcome when they had more chronic conditions. Um, and this you know, uh, uh, characterized our population. Also, in, early in the pandemic, we saw pretty dramatic declines in people seeking medical care um, in order to you know, protect themselves from COVID. On the other hand, those uh, healthcare use is particularly effective for this population and um, uh, not using healthcare also has um, uh, uh, elevates risk for poor outcomes. Next slide, please. Whoops, one back. Okay, so our uh, study was a retrospective cohort analysis. Um, our primary data source was uh, uh, Medicare uh, Medicaid insurance claims from North Carolina from 2017 to 2020. Um, and um, basically what we did is we looked at healthcare use in 2020 among a cohort of people enrolled in 2019. So we identified them in 2019, followed them into 2020. Then we constructed control cohorts using the same approach, um, but historically. So we identified folks in 2018, followed them into 2019 and 2017, and followed them into 2018. We focus on people who are 45 uh, to 64, and the results I'll show you today uh, primarily uh, focus on the comparison between use in 2020 relative to use in 2019. Next slide, please. 
So our sample, our study sample characteristics, we included people 45, 44 to 63 in their identification year, focused on those who were categorically eligible for Medicaid due to disability or blindness, and excluded people, excluded the people who were dually eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. Our sample included over 200,000 people across the three cohorts as defined by their identification year. Some characteristics of our cohort of interest, those identified in 2019 and followed into 2020, their average age was 56, their average Charleston score was 2.32, 53% were female, 51% white, 43% black. The most prevalent chronic conditions were diabetes, chronic pulmonary disease, and depression. Next slide, please. So we first looked at mortality. We estimated a survival model. Um, we compared um, more to the uh, mortality in 2020 relative to 2019, controlling for lots of individual characteristics. And probably not surprisingly, we found that mortality was elevated. The adjusted mortality hazard ratio for 2020 relative to 2019 um, was 1.23. Next slide, please. We also looked at healthcare use, and uh, now I'll show you a series of four figures that are structured in the same way. So what we're plotting here is basically along the x-axis, the, the months of the year, and the point estimate in the 95% confidence interval for, interval for each month represents the difference for that month between 2020 and 2019. Um, uh, and it's the difference relative to the difference in January. So we're controlling for that change, that time trend um, by normalizing by the difference in January. So, um, so the patterns are fairly clear. There was a dramatic reduction in April as has been documented by um, uh, many different studies in hospital admissions, that's on the left. Um, it recovered, hospital, the rates of hospital admissions recovered, but then remained at a slightly lower level, about 10% lower throughout the year. We see a similar pattern for emergency department visits, dramatic reduction in, in April, recovery, and remain, but remaining at lower levels through the rest of the year. Next slide, please. Office visits look a little different. We see that dramatic reduction, but then they you know, kind of bounce around month by month, but largely recover. And then if you look at the slide on the right, you can see that a lot of that, um, uh, the, you know, the stability or the um, uh, access to use for office visits was facilitated by telehealth. These are absolute increases in the number of telehealth visits peaked in April and then remained elevated through the rest of the year. Next slide. So to summarize our findings, we found that mortality increased in 2020 for older adults eligible for Medicaid due to disability relative to those earlier years. Hospital admissions and emergency department visits declined substantially in March, April, and May of 2020, and then increased in subsequent months, but remained at lower levels than they had been in 2019. Rates of office visits also initially declined substantially, um, but then largely recovered. Um, telehealth played an, a very important role in maintaining access to care for this population. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bundorf. Um, let me remind everyone to put questions in the chat if you have any questions. And we'll go to our next speaker, Dr. William Kier at the Alcohol Research Group and Public Health Institute. He's presenting on longitudinal assessment of drinking changes during the pandemic, the 2021 COVID-19 follow-up study to the 2019-20 National Alcohol Survey. Dr. Kier. Thank you. Do we have the slides? There we go. Um, right. So yeah, that's good. Uh, so this this paper, the the title here at the top um, is the um, right. That's the title of the the paper that's now in press at Alcoholism Clinical and Experimental Research. So you'll be able to see a lot more details of this in the next few weeks. And I want to you know thank my co-authors, UE Priscilla Martinez, Deidre Patterson, Tom Greenfield, Nina Molly at ARG and Kate Carrick or Jaffe at RTI. Next slide, please. And also NIAAA for the funding. Um, just some background context. Uh, alcohol consumption declined from a peak in the 70s and early 80s to the, to the mid 90s, and then has been gradually increasing ever since. Um, and just to, you know, this is in gallons, but 
the you know average amount drunk for each person 50 and older is is over 500 drinks now. So people in America drink uh, quite a lot. You can also note here that the declining gray line is beer, and the increasing uh, blue and uh, orange lines are spirits and wine. So there's been a shift from beer to spirits and wine going on for quite some time. We don't have the details on 2020 uh, changes in, in sales yet, but we expect that to be a historically large increase in sales of uh, you know at least a few percent, um, three to five percent maybe. So that which is quite big in 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 this context. Next slide, please. Uh, we have also seen <clears throat> deaths from alcohol-related causes increasing since 1999 with a, you know, a 51% age-adjusted increase to 2017. And then again, recent uh, study found a 25% increase during 2020. So again, su suggesting a pretty big increase in heavy drinking and particularly uh, likely among people with chronic long-term heavy drinking if it's pushing uh, death rates up by that much. And the largest changes were seen in younger adults. Next slide, please. Uh, the alcohol policy in the US um, is generally pretty liberal. Alcohol is pretty available and taxes are low. Uh, some of the changes that occurred uh, during uh, 2020, liquor stores basically stayed open except for in a couple states, they were considered uh, essential businesses, but a lot of bars were closed for quite a, a lot of the time and restaurants were closed or had limited hours or other kinds of limitations quite a bit. So there were definitely uh, you know, shifts from on-premise to off-premise consumption that occurred. Uh, some of the key uh, expansions of alcohol availability were the allowing to go drinks from bars and restaurants in many states and uh, expanding delivery options. And there were a few states that, that didn't really close bars much, but most of them did. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the data I'm gonna be talking about mainly today uh, come from a follow-up of the National Alcohol Survey that we've conducted at uh, ARG since 1979 in a you know sort of a comparable framework, or at least we try to make it comparable, and that's funded a, as part of our NIAAA Center. Um, in, in the survey, we have two main measures of alcohol consumption that, you know, both of which we included in our follow-up survey. One is the graduated frequency, where we start with the maximum a person had in the day and then get frequencies of 12 plus, 8 to 11, 5 to 7, and so forth. So we know how often people drank at different levels, and we can calculate total volume from that. And then separately, we ask about their frequency and usual quantity for occasion for beer, wine, and spirits separately. So, and, and these sort of get at different aspects of, of consumption and, and consumption change. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> in our recent surveys from 2000, one uh, notable uh, difference that I wanted to point out is that we've seen substantial increases in drinking among women but less change among men. So relatively flat with a little bit of an increase among men, but you know, very large increases among women. So this increasing trend in consumption up to the pandemic uh, was largely driven by women's drinking, we think. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the main findings I'll be talking about today come from a follow-up of uh, a subsample of our National Alcohol Survey uh, conducted in 2019 and 2020. The survey went through April of 2020, uh, but most of the data was collected before the pandemic began. In the paper, you can see a number of different sensitivity analyses we, we did around that. Um, the follow-up occurred in February and March of 2021, so about a year, but not quite a year later. So the reference period is April 2020, to uh, their survey date, which was mostly in February, somewhat in March. So it has about a year time frame, which is similar to the time frame um, for the drinking questions in the original survey. So we think that it's largely comparable. Next slide, please. So um, to, to get quickly to the results, 
this is just sort of an overview of uh, COVID impacts in the survey. So as of, you know, this is a while ago now. So as of, as of that time, 10% had gotten COVID themselves, about 30% in the family, 50% uh, had an essential worker in their household, about a third had had a serious economic impact, such as, you know, for each of these serious economic impacts, losing a job, household reduced pay, difficulty paying rent or mortgage. Um, food insecurity affected about 8% of the sample and uh, access to family and friends was, was changed significantly for over half. Next slide, please. Uh, and some of the other drinking measures other than alcohol volume that, that we're gonna look at in terms of change from pre to uh, during the pandemic, uh, current drinker defined in past 12 months, risky drinking with the usual definition of seven for women, 14 for men, or four or five per day. Uh, any five plus drinking, whether that was done, you know, at least one day in the past year. Daily drinking defined as reporting daily or nearly daily drinking. And then alcohol use disorders using DSM-5 uh, separated into mild AUD with two to three uh, endorsed symptoms and or four plus for moderate severe. Uh, next slide, please. So to get to the results for the, you know, we had a, a, a kind of a complex pattern of findings. In general, I'll be talking about increases in drinking, which I think is the, is the, the headline, but there were also decreases. We found reductions in current drinking, particularly among men, reductions in risky drinking, also particularly among men, and reductions in having any five plus, uh, again, mainly among men, but those are some pretty substantial reductions in those prevalence categories. At the same time, we saw a very large increase in daily drinking for both men and women, um, and increases in moderate severe AUD category. Um, I guess you know it's only significant for women, but it's really showing up for both, and uh, you know, pretty strong and large increase overall. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, beverage specific drinking, which we thought was you know, an, an interest, you know, maybe the more interesting uh, type of drinking change that we measured, we saw substantial increases in spirits and wine volume, and that occurred particularly through frequency of use. People were drinking more often at about the same level they had been before. We didn't see any t change in the typical quantities per occasion. Next slide. So uh, here are the, the results of the, the consumption measures. We, we did see, you'll see at the bottom, total volume from the beer, wine, and spirits significantly and substantially increased for both men and women. And uh, particularly, it was spirits volume that went up for both. For women, we also would see an increase in wine volume. Uh, we didn't have a significant increase in the graduated frequency volume, and that went up a little bit less than the beverage specific that may have been due to some details of how consumption changed. Um, I don't have time to get into all, all of that now, but, um, but that also went up, so they're not, they're not inconsistent either. Next slide. Uh, then we looked at um, these changes by a number of different um, subcategories. Uh, looking by age, we didn't really see increases for 18 to 34. Um, but particularly at age 35 to 49, uh, working age population, we saw the, most, the largest increase is now called volume, heavy drinking days in AUD. And then for the group 50 and older, we also saw increases in volume and drinking days and especially spirits, but not quite as big. Next slide. Um, so here are for the three age groups, uh, we see a bit of a reduction in current drinking for 50 plus reductions in risky and five plus prevalence for 18 to 34. And then all the groups are increasing daily drinking. You know, interestingly, it wasn't significant in that middle age group, but uh, fairly large and significant increases in that and the others. Um, probably the most concerning and maybe important thing here is this increase in moderate to severe AUD among the 35 to 49 group. Next slide. Uh, for these, uh, we, here I'm only including the 35 to 49 and 50 plus group where we saw the biggest changes in consumption. The consumption measures didn't really change in the younger group. 
And we see that, you know, this 835 to 49 group, both the, the GF and the beverage specific volumes go up quite a lot. We see increases in three to four and five plus drinks or volume from, from those levels of drinking, which is, you know, an you know, important risk factor. And then wine and spirits particularly driving the increases in drinking and that coming from uh, this increase in drinking days. Um, the only thing going up for the, the older group significantly was spirits again. Next slide. Uh, looking by race, race and ethnicity group differences, we do find some significant differences here. Um, for uh, the white population, we saw a decline in current risky and drinking in five plus days, like as we had seen overall, and increased daily drinking spirits, wine, and AUDs as we had seen overall. The, for the black population was where we saw the biggest increase in drinking, very large increases in volume, five plus days, and prevalence of AUD. And uh, somewhat surprisingly uh, for the Hispanic Latinx population, we saw no increased drinking at all or changes in AUDs. Next slide. So here, uh, looking across the three race and ethnicity groups, um, sort of you know, mirroring what I just said about reductions in prevalence for the white group. So the reductions in risky drinking any 5 plus also occurred uh, for in the black population, they weren't significant. We have a you know, fairly small sample there. So you know, these results should be taken with some, some limitation uh, because of that. But it, it does seem like it's sort of the same problem in both the, the white and black populations. Reduced uh, prevalence, but increased daily drinking and increased moderate to severe AUD. So a sort of uh, you know, separate, you know, the, the heaviest drinkers seem perhaps to have to have gotten gotten worse. Uh, next slide. And then in terms of consumption volume, uh, this is what I was talking about in terms of the black populations drinking, at least in this sample, really went up dramatically. Many of these uh, indicators doubling for volume, for volume from five plus drinks, spirits, wine, um, and even beer volume going up. So we really saw a dramatic increase there whereas uh, in the Hispanic Latinx population, we didn't, didn't see any changes at all. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, so to summarize, we more alcohol, more spirits and wine, that's coming from increased drinking frequency, probably from people having more time at home to drink during the pandemic, um, especially in the black population and in uh, eight, the, the 35 to 49 age group. Um, and then more AUD is probably the, the headline finding that we found here. Next. We, you know, didn't really change much. Uh, we didn't really strengthen alcohol policies during the pandemic, despite concerns about this. In fact, some efforts to increase taxes were sort of beaten back because of the pandemic and people's sympathy towards uh, bars and restaurants uh, making money off of alcohol. Um, even though the liquor companies uh, really cleaned up, uh, it, it was certainly a tough time for on-premise establishments. And you know, the need for intervention and treatment was also there. There's there's a lot to discuss about how you know how that how the pandemic impacted the uh, provision of both of those things. Uh, next slide, and I think I'm about out of time. But just to wrap up, we're looking at a lot of other uh, aspects of this. This is just the first paper from our survey. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Kerr. Um, next, we'll have a presentation from Dr. Sharon Barron and Daisy Flores on safe and just cleaners, COVID-19 among Latinx household cleaners in New York City. Thanks a lot. Um, so our project <clears throat> Safe and Just Cleaners is a supplemental study within an ongoing community-based participatory research project that's investigating exposures to hazardous chemical components of cleaning products among Latinx house cleaners in New York City. Next slide. Our academic research partners are located at the City University of New York and the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Next slide. 
our community partners make the road new york a large social action community based organization and they have organized the super cleaners who are an amazing group of house cleaners who work with us on all aspects of the project as you will hear next slide our parent project <clears throat> for our parent project we recruited a cohort of 402 spanish speaking house cleaners who participated in a one hour in-person survey to capture data about their working conditions and health. We completed our survey administration for our parent project in February, 2020, a few weeks before the start of the pandemic. Next slide. This cohort of 402 cleaners were almost all female. The average age was 45 years. All were immigrants, but on average had lived in the United States 16 years. 38% reported being uncomfortable with spoken English. 44% were the primary family wage earners and 49% lacked health insurance coverage. Next slide. The aims of our COVID SEBI supplement were to estimate the COVID infection rate and social and economic impacts of our cohort during the first year of the pandemic and to develop outreach and communication materials to help the cleaners work and live more safely during the pandemic. Next. To accomplish the first two aims, we conducted a follow-up telephone survey with the cohort, which we fielded between March and June of 2021. Since one of our parent project goals was building leadership amongst the cleaners, we trained two of the study participants who were members of the super cleaners group to become interviewers, and they conducted much of the outreach and interviews with the support of our community partner. We successfully resurveyed 74% of the initial cohort. In the follow-up survey, we repeated three health measures from our initial survey, the 10 item CESD depression scale, the 10 item Cohen's perceived stress scale and the single item overall self-reported health question. In addition to the survey, we offered the participants the option of completing a home SARS-CoV-2 antibody dry blood spot test. Next slide. Regarding COVID-19, we found that as of June, 2021, 54% of the cleaners reported that they had had COVID-19 and the seasonal pattern of when they had COVID-19 mirrored the pattern for the rest of New York City. In addition, 61% reported that they had household members who had had COVID-19. And echoing some of the results from the panel this morning, 51% reported that they had family or friends either in the US or abroad that had died of COVID-19. Next slide. Approximately 40% of the survey respondents consented to and returned the home antibody test. And the rate of self-reported COVID in this group was like those who did not complete the home antibody test. Overall, we found that 57% of those who took the home test had positive results for antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. 78% of those who self-reported they had had COVID were antibody positive, and 27% of those who did not report having COVID were antibody positive. So using both the survey data and the home antibody results, we estimate that up until June 2021, the rate of COVID infection in our cohort was between 57% and perhaps as high as 70%. And most of these infections occurred before the vaccine was available. Next slide. We also found relatively high levels of vaccine acceptance. Overall, 45% had already received at least one vaccine shot. But since the survey occurred just as the vaccine was being rolled out, among those interviewed later in the survey period, May, between May and June 2021, 66% had already been vaccinated and three quarters of those not yet vaccinated intended to get vaccinated. Next slide. 
Regarding the house cleaners work experience during COVID, 29% worked during the shutdown between March and June, 2020. 78% continued house cleaning after June 2020, though most with reduced hours. 64% of those who worked during COVID reported that they could not take sick leave, paid or unpaid, without retaliation. Increased exposure to cleaning products containing bleach and disinfectants was also common. Next. Levels of perceived stigma from their employers was high. Almost half expressed that a diagnosis of COVID-19 would lead them to be either likely or somewhat likely to feel afraid or embarrassed to disclose this to their employer. This rate was not different for those who did compared to those who did not report having COVID. Next slide. We measured food insecurity using the two item USDA measure. 86% would be classified as food insecure and 36% as severely food insecure. Next slide. Housing insecurity was also common. 5% were homeless, 40% worry about whether they will have a place to live, and 24% owed more than $1,000 in back rent. Additionally, 21% of workers reporting reported lack of security in their own homes, either by reporting feeling unsafe or reporting that someone with whom they had romantic relationships yelled at them or said things that made them feel scared or bad about themselves. Next slide. In terms of health outcomes, both mental health and self-reported health declined as compared to their pre-COVID survey. We created logistic regression models for each of these health outcomes using standard cut points while controlling for workers pre-COVID levels for these same health outcomes. Next slide. This first model is for the outcome of perceived stress. In the table for clarity, I placed the statistically significant increased odds for COVID disease related variables above the line and the social and economic variables below the line. COVID related variables included having at least one household member who was COVID positive, having a family member or friend die of COVID, not yet being vaccinated and perceiving COVID-19 stigma from their employer. We also found that food insecurity, not having a secure place to live and domestic insecurity all had statistically significant increased odds. Next slide. For depression, our model found that being COVID positive and experiencing food insecurity and domestic insecurity all had increased odds. Next slide. And finally, for poor or fail, fair self-reported health, we found that having lost income from household cleaning because the respondent might infect their client with COVID and being the primary family wage earner and experiencing food insecurity and domestic insecurity all had increased odds. Next slide. So now I'll turn the presentation over to um, my collaborator, Daisy Flores from our community partner organization, Make the Road, to talk about our educational and policy related activities. Thank you, Terry, and thanks again for having us today. Our research team uh, gathered important evidence about the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on our cohort. Therefore, our challenge as Major in New York has been to organize actions to address the pandemic's impact on low-income immigrant workers in New York as the cleaners that participated in our study. Using the social ecological model that most of you are familiar with, Make the Road has led many actions at different levels, from educational activities directed to our members, to organizing house of cleaners, advocating for legislative initiatives to ameliorate the COVID-19 impact. Next, please. To address the economic impact, Make the Road New York in coalition with other community organizations advocated creating a fund for immigrant undocumented workers who were excluded from other 
federal COVID-related economic stimulus programs, such as the cleaners that participated in our study. In June 2021, the Fund for Rescue Workers Coalition led to the appropriation of $2.1 billion for economic support for immigrant undocumented workers. This funding was distributed rapidly and it was gone in less than two months. Some of the cleaners from our study were able to get this benefit. Next slide, please. Like economic insecurity, the housing problem was a big concern for many New Yorkers who couldn't afford to pay their rent. To cancel rent, the cancel rent campaign advocated creating a fund to support workers that lost their job due to COVID. This legislation also prohibited evictions. Major New York, along with the Housing for All Coalition, secured two point four million rent relief program, which covers up to twelve months of back rent or utility bills. Next slide. As Sherry mentioned earlier, our research found that nearly half of household cleaners that participated in our study lacked health coverage at the time they were interviewed. Based on that research funding, household cleaners decided to support the Coverage for All campaign, which seeks to expand health coverage to all New Yorkers, including its immigrant residents who are currently excluded from enrolling in coverage because of their immigration status. The Coverage for All Coalition keeps advocating to pass this legislation into the budget, Cleaners are sharing their testimonies and mobilizing to support this demand. Next slide, please. In 2018, Make Their Own New York created La Super Cleaners Group, a safe space for household cleaners to meet, learn, and work together to increase awareness about environmental toxics and health impacts among household cleaners to reduce exposure to harmful cleaning chemicals. Around 50 cleaners meet regularly to address these issues. Before the pandemic, they used to meet in person, as you can see on the pictures on this slide, but those meetings are now happen happening virtually. Organizing these workers has been one of the first steps towards building capacity to support upcoming actions. As household cleaning work is isolated, having a safe space for them to connect with other workers has been crucial in understanding the common problems they are facing. Next, please. During the pandemic, many household cleaners lost their jobs and the ones that kept working were deeply concerned about performing their work under safe conditions. In that context, the leaders of the Super Cleaners Group created educational videos in Spanish aimed at household cleaners about cleaning during COVID-19, disinfecting product use, returning to work, protecting yourself after cleaning, and mental health care. These videos were widely distributed throughout Maker New York social media, reaching hundreds of workers. Next, please. Creating educational materials has been one of the initial priorities for our team. An important outcome has been developing the safe and just cleaning, safer use of chemicals in household cleaning work curriculum. Recently, and after learning how to deliver online training, Maker New York and NDWA members, household cleaners themselves, have trained 300 household cleaners in New York City. Next slide, please. In 2020, we started collaborating with the Cancer Free Economy Network with the goal of expanding our actions to better address exposure to harmful cleaning chemicals. The network has provided technical expertise and funding to support the Super Cleaners Group's educational activities and some campaign initiatives. By the end of last year, we launched the Household Cleaner Safety Lab Working Group, a cross node collaboration committed to designing and testing solutions to reduce household cleaners' exposures to cleaning, cleaning products. Due to the dramatic increase in the use of disinfectants within the cleaning work, we're currently exploring a couple of campaign ideas, such as a communication campaign aimed to reduce the use of disinfectants and a campaign to promote the use of safer cleaning products. Next slide. And now, uh, the recovery process is ongoing, but very slowly for some communities. Something that we found is that community uh, COVID-19 has highlighted the urgency to increase workplace health and safety protections, especially for essential workers. As it is well documented, communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. Therefore, more resources to support these communities are urgently needed. And public health and essential workers' safety and mental health should be a priority as part of the recovery process. Next slide, please. Finally, and on behalf of our team, the next uh, the final slide. Thank you. I would like to thank SV for giving us a space to share our project findings and actions. We're hoping that more researchers get excited about working collaboratively with community organizations to address the impact of the pandemic. For those interested in learning more about our project, please visit our web website, safeandjustcleaners.org. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Barron and um, Ms. Flores. Um, now, we will have the next pre presenter is Dr. Kelly Sittner and Dane Hautala. 
Yes, it's Hadala. Actually, Dane couldn't uh, join us today. Okay. Um, so so uh, I'm, I'm Kelly Sittner. And um, if you can go back to the first slide, please. Previous one. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to begin by emphasizing that, like the previous study, this is an ongoing longitudinal community-based participatory research project. And we owe a tremendous thanks to our hardworking interviewers and our participants. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to just give basic brief backgrounds here. Um, indigenous peoples have experienced disparately high rates of COVID-19 disease and death, both in the United States and in Canada. And these COVID-19 impacts are compounded by historical legacies of colonial oppression, structural inequality, such as poverty, racism, barriers to healthcare, and then higher prevalence of comorbidities such as diabetes and heart disease. So it becomes really critical to understand the various ways that the current pandemic has changed the lives and the well-being of indigenous peoples, both in the US and Canada. Next slide, please. Um, the parent project for this supplement is the Healing Pathways Project, which is an 11 wave multi generational CBPR study in partnership with eight reservations and reserves in the US and Canada, and it has spanned roughly from 2002 to 2021. The data for the um, COVID supplement were collected between November 2020 and April 2021, with a subsample of 149 of the young adults. And we used a mix of interviewer administered surveys and self administered web surveys, depending on whether the participant had already completed their wave 11 interview at that time or not. And our aim for the supplement was to characterize the prevalence of COVID 19 related socioeconomic, cultural, historical, and behavioral stressors for Indigenous young adults living on or near reservations um, who participate in the Healing Pathways longitudinal study. Next slide, please. There were sizable numbers of young adults who did not use alcohol, tobacco, or drugs, but of those who did, between 11 and 17.6% reported they increased their use depending on the substance. Far fewer of the participants reported decreased use. Next slide, please. And um, mental health seemed to get worse over the course of the pandemic, which many um, previous um, presenters have noted. About half the participants reported their mental health was somewhat or much worse since the start of the pandemic, compared to fewer than 12% who reported their mental health was somewhat or much better. Next slide, please. Stressors, uh, as people have noted, were very common during the pandemic. For those who were employed at the start of the pandemic, 44.2% lost hours, 46.3% were laid off or furloughed, and 20% lost a job. Participants also reported significant financial strains. 57% had difficulty paying bills and 44% had trouble getting enough food to eat. We also had a sizable number of participants who were responsible for caring for children during the pandemic. 71.7% um, were responsible for children in some capacity and 82% of those individuals were the primary caregivers for children. Um, more than 80% of the caregivers said their children's school was canceled or moved to distance format or altered in some other substantial way. And 74% said caregiving conflicted with work responsibilities. Next, please. Next slide, please. And COVID-19's impact on Indigenous peoples is experienced both as a current pandemic, but it's also a historically traumatic stressor. And we asked the participants how often they thought about the impact of COVID-19 on their people. And 40.6% thought daily um, or almost daily or multiple times each day about how it was impacting their people. Um, and 24.5% thought daily about losses of their people to viral disease. More than 86% of the participants said they were concerned about the loss of elders, the loss of family and the loss of friends. Next slide, please. But despite all the challenges that COVID has brought for um, our, our participants, um, they found many ways to give back to their communities to, and to cope with COVID-19. So they helped others in their community by providing food, transportation, shelter, or childcare. They provided traditional medicine, ceremonies, or cultural practices for others, or they made PPE for people in their community. And they use common coping strategies, such as utilizing traditional cultural practices, exercising, spending time with family, following public health guidelines and just spending time outside. Next slide, please. And the Healing Pathways participants who completed the COVID survey are a resilient and optimistic group of young adults. 
Nearly all agreed or strongly agreed that what happens in their tribe or community depends on working to protect each other from COVID-19. Working together on protective practices, they can help protect others. And they also agreed or strongly agreed that their community is taking active steps to protect elders. Next slide, please. So thank you, and I am looking forward to your questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Sittner. Um, again, please be reminded to put your questions in the chat. And the presenters will also take a look and try to answer them. So the next presentation is Dr. Lu Dung on sleep changes during the COVID-19. Next slides, please. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share our data. So today my talk will focus on the pandemic related sleep changes in urban um, American Indian Alaska Native youth. And these data come from our ongoing NIMHD funded national study, which stands for Native American Youth Sleep, Health and Wellness Study. Next slide, please. So um, American Indian Alaska Native um, people is one of the racial minority groups that's um, deeply affected by a range of housing equities, including high risks of um, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, um, substance use, uh, mental health problems, including uh, depression and suicide. So these housing equities lead to shorter life expect expectancies among Native people about five years shorter than that of um, the overall US population. And sleep health is increasingly being recognized as a key contributor to each of these negative health outcomes. However, there's been limited data focusing on sleep or sleep health among native individuals. The literature so far shows that native adults may have high rates of sleep problems such as insufficient sleep, but we also know that these risks for poor sleep health, as well as um, the consequent um, health outcomes, negative health outcomes, start to develop early in life. Therefore, there's a critical need to study and characterize sleep health in um, native youth. Next, next slide, please. So most of the research so far on Native people has been focusing on those living on tribal lands or reservations, but about 70% of all Native Americans live off reservations and many live in urban environments. And there's a long list of upstream social determinants that may contribute to the health inequities affecting urban Native people. This including um, legacies of systemic racism, including, for example, the forced relocation of Native people off their lands and the consequent um, uh, subsequent um, uh, disconnection with their communities and loss of cultural identity. So this is also includes exposure to poverty, um, crowded housing conditions, and reduced access to healthcare and other resources. Uh, next, please. So as Dr. Sidner and other presenters have highlighted, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated um, existing health and social inequities among racial ethnic minority groups in the US, including the Native people. For example, this graph compares um, Native people, which is shown in the light blue bars um, uh, with white Americans in dark blue bars in terms of the COVID-19 related um, uh, deaths across age groups. And you can see that the uh, COVID-related mortality rates, particularly among younger age groups, um, have been nearly twice as high among AIAN individuals compared to white Americans. Next, please. So in collaboration with our community-based partners, our team has been working with urban um, native populations. Specifically, our nation study um, have been following a cohort of um, uh, AIAN adolescents living in urban California. Um, the goal of NESHA is to learn about um, native, uh, urban native adolescents sleep and how sleep has been affecting their health. In addition, as part of the overall community-based research effort, 
Um, it is also our goal to actively engage the community through the research process to ensure that our research serves the community's need. Um, our project will produce data to show what's needed and how to best support the housing needs of urban um, neighborhoods. Next, please. So with this ongoing NASA study, when the pandemic hit in the spring of 2020, we were well positioned to conduct a mixed method study during the early months of the pandemic and um, the California stay at home order. Our goal here is to look at how the pandemic has affected um, these adolescents um, in terms of their sleep and out health outcomes and how the family community and cultural factors may have mitigated any negative effects from the pandemic and promote um, resiliency. Next, please. Now, our, for our quantitative components, um, the sample included 118 um, AIAN youths who, were, uh, who completed a baseline survey between 2018 and March of 2020, 2020 um, as well as uh, during the stay-at-home order in California, which was between May and September 2020. And the mean age of this sample at baseline was 14, about 60% uh, were female. Um, so our survey uh, conducted at both baseline and COVID um, uh, waves um, assessed the number of dimensions of sleep health, including sleep duration, sleep timing, and um, quality. We also assessed uh, family, community, and cultural factors, including um, engagement with traditional practices, um, for example, eating, drumming, um, native cooking classes, um, many of these activities have moved uh, online during the pandemic, um, and we hypothesize that these may be important protective factors. Um, and our quality, quantitative analysis also, uh, mainly looked at changes in sleep from the baseline survey to the pandemic uh, survey, and how um, family, community, and cultural factors may have um, moderated and observed uh, sleep changes. Next, please. In terms of the qualitative component, we conducted video-based qualitative interviews um, in uh, 20 teams. So the goal here was to get a better sense of the lived experience of these views during the pandemic and their view on how the pandemic has affected their sleep, their daily routines, as well as their perception of the role of family, um, community, and cultural factors. And these interviews were transcribed, coded, and analyzed to provide um, the co more context for interpreting our survey results. Next, please. So when we, when we look at the uh, changes from the surveys in terms of the self-reported sleep, time, duration, and quality, um, there were effects in different directions. So first, you can see here that during the COVID, um, uh, survey, or in the COVID survey, teens reported uh, much later that time. So they're sleeping consider considerably um, later, um, particularly during the week, uh, weekdays. Uh, next, please. Um, their wake up time also um, got much later. So they had more time to, um, more opportunity in the morning to sleep in, despite going to bed much later. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, so these sleep um, schedule changes um, probably is more in line with uh, adolescents' uh, natural uh, biological clock. Next, please. In terms of the sleep duration, they it also got consider considerably longer. Um, teens were getting up to two hours of active sleep during um, the pandemic as compared to the baseline survey. And these increases in sleep duration um, are largely due to the removal uh, or changes in the school schedule, especially the early school uh, start time, uh, which in the uh, baseline of pre-pandemic times was the main constraint to getting um, teens enough sleep. Next, please. And at the same time, even though they're sleeping longer, um, teens reported more sleep 
disturbances, and also um, the next row shows a, a slightly worsened um, sleep quality during COVID. So these are negative changes that may reflect increases in stress and mental health issues during the pandemic. Uh, next, please. And uh, next, next slide, please. So we also, we also look at potential moderators of these um, sleep changes. Um, we found significant moderating effects of family cohesion and cultural factors on um, weekday sleep duration. So higher levels of family cohesion um, and greater uh, participation or engagement in uh, traditional practices moderated the COVID related increases in sleep duration uh, during weekdays. So uh, this graph shows um, the moderating effects for participation in traditional practices. Um, you can see that the weekday sleep duration increased overall, but this increase uh, was more pronounced among those who participated in more traditional practices um, compared to those who engaged in less. Next, please. So our qualitative interviews uh, results could, could, uh, uh, provided more context for interpreting our survey with quantity results. Um, our team participants noted a number of factors that either help or worsen their sleep. So for example, you can see um, teams talked about um, the increased sleep or increased opportunity to sleep in uh, due to the lack of um, having, you know, having to go to wake up early and go to school, uh, but also there were profound um, disruptions to their daily activities with daily rhythms, which made it harder to feel sleepy at night. Next, please. So our qualitative results also highlights the increase of um, technology use during the day. So these are changes in daily activities and routines. And teams also talk about um, activities or behaviors that they engage in during the day to um, increase their uh, sleep drive. So these factors um, during the daytime have impact on their sleep at night. Next, please. Now, finally, in line with our quantitative results, um, our participants um, talk about key insights into how family cohesion and engagement in traditional practices have evolved during the pandemic. For example, um, students talked about spending more time with their parents and community, um, and in some cases getting closer to them. Um, others describe um, using traditional practices um, that either help them cope with the stresses um, of the pandemic or help them improve sleep. And this last quote um, talked about how family discussions about um, Native history um, were used as a strategy to make sense of the pandemic. So in summary, um, next slide, please. In summary, we have seen both positive and negative impacts of the pandemic on sleep health changes. And um, particularly from our qualitative analysis, we found evidence for important resilience strategies operating at both family and cultural levels um, that serve to mitigate adverse effects of the pandemic disruptions. Next, please. Um, so I'd like to share this short video created by one of our community partners to show that um, despite the many American Indians in Los Angeles County. So I wanted to show that the Native communities, despite the COVID um, you know, the disruptions, they have been tremendously resilient in the face of the pandemic and using kind of visual, uh, virtual tools to engage in traditional practices, um, which is an important protective factor. Um, um, I'd like to show this video and then we um, release the end of our We are dealing with the effects of physical distancing, feeling anxious, depressed, and unbalanced. United American Indian Involvement, we're here to help by offering drive-up events, online therapy sessions, emergency basic services, 
and virtual workshops focused on traditional activities. Cooking workshops. Even singing, dancing, and drumming. Experience wellness through community, culture, and connection at UAII Seven Generations. Next slide, please. Um, so basically, in thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dung. Um, did you want to finish up with anything? Yes, I um, just want to highlight that we um, look at multi level influences, which indicates that intervention needs to be at multi level as well. And then I'd like to show the last slides uh, to give acknowledgement of our amazing. Next, please, um, from RAND, UCLA, ASU, and our um, community partner, as well as the funding from Next. Next slide, please. Um, okay, if you go to the next slide, she wants to show the thank yous. Yes, that was the previous, previous slide, please. Okay, so um, thank you, Dr. Dung. Next is Julie um, Baldwin, um, also discussing um, Native American Nations um, trust and vaccines. Dr. Baldwin. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm happy to be able to present some of our preliminary findings today. Next slide. Okay, so the goal of the project was to establish effective culturally appropriate strategies to enhance participation of American Indian and Alaska Native communities and prevention and treatment of COVID-19, including vaccine trials and future vaccine uptake. We had three aims to first assess awareness, knowledge, experience, et cetera, regarding COVID-19 vaccine trials and uptake of the vaccine to then develop and adapt culturally appropriate educational materials and strategies to increase awareness about these things and also decrease um, mistrust, and then to implement the educational session and evaluate the impact of these materials. Next slide. Two consensus panels were conducted via Zoom with the participating community health representatives or CHRs from each tribe. And in the cons first consensus panel, the CHRs were presented with the health educational materials that we adapted from uh, up-to-date COVID-19 guidelines and health information from CDC and the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health. And after taking some time to review the handouts, the CHRs commented based on the, these three criteria, which included the language, format, and organization, and imagery and colors. And then after consensus panel one, we revised the handouts based on the CHR's feedback and guidance and presented the revised handouts back for review. Following that, the final edits were made and materials were printed for community distribution. Next slide, please. This just illustrates the different materials that we developed and notes too much information to read at this time, but we'd be happy to share these with you if you're interested. Next slide. The CHRs administered a pretest survey and a post-test survey a month after the educational session. And the pre and post surveys were adapted from the NIH Phoenix Toolkit and the NIH SEAL Common Survey. And the questions addressed um, attitudes towards COVID-19 vaccination and clinical trials, trust in various health messengers regarding COVID-19, knowledge about the vaccines, including how they work, the side effects, and arranging for a vaccine. And we also asked respondents their perspective on the handouts and the educational materials they received. The survey was uploaded into REDCap, um, which you may know is a secure web platform for building and managing online databases and surveys. And using iPads, the CHRs surveyed community members and uploaded the data to the project server. Next slide. So these are just some of the preliminary results. Again, um, most participants were between the ages of 21 and 50 years of age. About 65% of participants identified as women, 33% men, remaining 2% non-binary, gender queer, or gender fluid, or preferred not to answer. And about 95% identified as American Indian or Alaska Native. There are many 5% were Black, White, or African-American, and other. 
And regarding household makeup, uh, nearly 70% of the respondents housed between two to five people in their household. And 18% of the households had no members vaccinated. About 50% of the households had at least one member that had gotten COVID-19. Next slide. The most trusted health messengers included the respondent's doctor or healthcare provider and the community health worker or representative. The least trusted health messengers included respondents' contacts in social media, the Arizona government, and the US government. Next slide. These are a few of the most frequently cited reasons for and against COVID-19 vaccination and clinical trial participation. The top reasons for vaccination, I wanna keep my family safe, I wanna keep myself safe, I wanna keep my community safe. Reasons against vaccination, I'm concerned about the side effects from the vaccine, I don't know enough about how well the COVID vaccine works, and I don't trust that the vaccine will be safe. And then three reasons why they would not take part in a clinical trial, I don't understand what will happen to me. I don't trust the government. The COVID-19 vaccine may not be safe. Next slide. We did see some significant change in knowledge pre and post test. Um, specifically, 32% of the respondents who did not know how to sign up for a clinical trial in their area at baseline did know how at follow-up. And knowledge regarding the vaccine um, improved upon respondents in these ways, explaining how the vaccine works, explaining the side effects of the vaccine and being able to arrange for themselves or a family member to be vaccinated. And then last slide, please, or next to last, next. Yes, more than half of the respondents reported using the COVID session handouts to talk to a family member or friend about getting vaccinated. 72% uh, agreed or strongly agreed they felt satisfied with the educational session. 64% agreed the session felt relevant to them and their community and their culture. 67% agreed that the information provided was trustworthy. And you can see some of the other responses here too. Thank you. Next slide. We just wanna sincerely thank the three participating Native nations and the CHR programs and the CHRs of each nation for their time and efforts. Without him, this project would not be possible. And a special thanks to our NAU team members. And of course, we're very grateful for the financial support for this project from NIMHD. Next slide. Happy to answer any questions, um, or you feel free to contact me via email. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. Um, now for our last presentation, um, Dr. Keeley Cheslick Gustava, um, and she'll be discussing race and ethnicity variations in mental health with COVID in diverse urban populations. Thank you. Um, okay, so. Um, Right, so today I'll be presenting some results on race and ethnic variation in mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic in a population that was derived by combining participants from three different longitudinal cohort uh, studies, all of which are based in the New York City metropolitan area, but um, which each have varying makeups in terms of their race, ethnic, and SES compositions, um, mainly due to the underlying um, sampling strategies and exposures on which the original cohorts were um, derived. Okay, and um, here we have the, the next slide. Um, okay, so as we all know um, far too well, the COVID-19 pandemic presented an unprecedented mass stressor. Um, and this slide here shows the ups and downs of case rates over time in New York and New Jersey, where our study population is based. And um, the three blue rectangles that you see here uh, indicate the timing of the three waves of the telephone survey that I'll be discussing, which we conducted among uh, participants who were already enrolled in ongoing cohort studies. And notably, the first and second survey waves coincided with the first and second uh, peaks of COVID-19 cases in the region. And next slide, please. Okay, so uh, two contradictory characterizations of the pandemic as a stressor quickly became apparent. First, it was universal. That is, everyone was in a sense exposed and could potentially be impacted in terms of their mental health. But secondly, the impacts were not evenly distributed. Um, groups of lower socioeconomic status and minoritized race and ethnicities were disproportionately impacted due to economic and employment resources, to essential worker status and to housing conditions, 
to differential risk of mortality associated with COVID-19 infection and to concurrent societal events um, at the time um, involving racially motivated attacks and discrimination. Um, therefore, uh, we decided to focus on questions uh, which would attempt to understand how and whether some of these disparities were related to mental health during the pandemic in our, uh, in our populations. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, Okay, so the study which we came to refer to as the COVID-19 check-in study consisted of a random sample of just over 1,200 subjects from three ongoing cohorts um, in the New York City area. And there are, the participation rate was 75, 76% um, among those who were invited. Um, the three different um, study populations were originally sampled based on different childhood trauma exposures. One was a group based on exposure to parental criminal justice system involvement. The second was based on indirect exposure, meaning take-home exposure of the parent, um, the parent of a youth to the 9-11 World Trade Center attack. Um, and then the third was based on direct youth exposure to the 9-11 uh, attack. Each study uh, included both um, exposed and unexposed groups, groups to the relevant childhood trauma, and each cohort enrolled and followed both youth and parental participants. And so our COVID check-in study was derived from participants across all three of these groups. Uh, the first wave of our three telephone interviews was conducted uh, from March through September, 2020, a period when New York City was at the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States and all in-person ongoing study interviews uh, for these cohort studies were paused. These telephone interviews were conducted in the language chosen by each participant, which was English for 91%, Spanish for 8% and Mandarin for 1%. Um, okay, next slide, please. This slide shows the characteristics of all participants, which totaled 1,227 participants across three waves of telephone interviews. The mean age was 42, roughly divided between the parent and the youth who um, at this point are young adults. They were um, all enrolled originally as um, children and adolescents and currently are young adults. Um, and uh, the overall population encompassed a range of household income levels, race and ethnic backgrounds, and marital statuses. Close to a quarter reported having a chronic medical condition. Now I will discuss two sets of results from the study. Next slide, please. Okay. A first set of analyses focused on worries. So, um, Worries are defined as repetitive thoughts about future negative events and threats and encompass both the perceived probability and the perceived impact. Worries are ubiquitous and they can be both beneficial and harmful. And they are also a feature of many psychiatric disorders, including a central feature of generalized anxiety disorder. The first wave of phone interviews included 36 dichotomous items about the content of participants' worries, covering COVID-19 and other health concerns, economic security, discrimination, violence, interference with ordinary life, and worries about the state of society and the future. Next slide, please. The most prevalent specific worry items among all participants were those related to US and world politics, to American values, to individual and family health, including potential infection with COVID-19 and about return to normalcy post pandemic. Um, these eight out of the 36 items shown on the slide are those um, eight out of the 36, which were endorsed by 50% or more of the participants. And please note that on this slide, the lower range of the axis starts at 50%. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. 
Okay, so we operationalized the content of the worries using exploratory factor analysis. The different sets of worries that loaded onto different factors are shown here um, in uh, each in a different color. Uh, and for each of these, for each of these different factors, we then created standardized factor scores, which could be interpreted as the individual's expressed level of worry for each of the different categories. Next slide, please. Um, our, so our analysis then focused on investigating socioeconomic and race and ethnic differences in the categories of worry experienced. In multivariable adjusted models, the mean standardized factor scores for worry that was related to basic economic needs, to job or employment, and to violence or victimization all diminished with an increasing level of household income, um, indicating that those worries were related to household, to the level of household income. However, worries related to politics, to COVID-19 and to health and to uh, return to normalcy post COVID were not related to income level. And worry about vacation plans or travel actually was higher um, among those with higher household income levels. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the, the category of worry that was most strongly associated with race ethnicity when comparing minoritized groups to white non-Hispanic individuals was violence and victimization. Um, COVID-19 and health worries were also significantly higher among Hispanic and Asian participants relative to those who were white and non-Hispanic. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, now I'm going to move to results um, that used um, information over the three waves on trends during the pandemic in psychiatric and substance use outcomes. While a range of studies have documented adverse mental health outcomes associated with the pandemic, fewer have examined trends in the same individuals over time to identify sources of heterogeneity, which may be relevant for targeting resources to those at greatest risk of um, sustained problematic outcomes. Next slide, please. Could we, oh, thank you. Um, so here we just show the total number of participants in each of the three waves of telephone interviews. Uh, out of the initial total, we had 76% participate in wave two and 66% partici 66 participate in wave three. Next slide, please. So uh, the participant race and ethnic distribution was reasonably similar across the three waves. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, here we show the patterns over time in the overall prevalence of four outcomes that were measured across all three waves. Specifically, these were depression, anxiety, and recent increases in alcohol or tobacco use by smoking or vaping. And what we see here overall is that the prevalence of each of these outcomes declined in our population over the course of the pandemic. And so this is from the early pandemic um, to about a year later across three waves. So next slide, please. Okay, so in order to test whether these trends also applied within individuals and when adjusting for covariates like personal um, characteristics and demographics, we used mixed effects logistic regression models. The results shown here are specifically for anxiety and they show, um, which was also the case across all four outcomes, a significant decreasing time trend across waves, and that's shown with the adjusted odds ratio of 0.53 in the top row, which is uh, below one indicating a decrease over time. We also saw associations with time varying exposures, specifically odds of anxiety were increased with higher level of household financial impact of COVID with being positive for recent exposure to COVID, um, and with concern about violent crime. Next slide, please. However, we found that the overall model masks important differences in the time trend in anxiety with respect to race and ethnicity. Specifically, 
while there was in fact a decreasing time trend in anxiety for most groups that are demonstrated by the lines with a downward slope from left to right and the odds ratio is below 1.0. This was not the case among Asians for whom the time trend was an increasing, although not statistically significant odds ratio of 1.5, which is shown in um, purple on the graph here with the upward sloping line. Tests for interaction indicated that this was a statistically significant effect heterogeneity. Next slide, please. Okay, so to try to understand factors that might be related to this difference, we examined race and ethnic differences in time varying exposures um, related to experiences of racism, as well as to exposure to COVID and to financial impacts. While none of, while none of these factors um, as measured proved explanatory in our models, it was important to note that perceived discrimination was highest among Asians out of all of the race and ethnic groups and um, was increasing across three waves. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, in conclusion, these results highlighted certain mental health disparities during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, specifically lower income and minoritized race and ethnic groups were disproportionately affected by certain categories of worry and temporal trends of decreasing anxiety that were observed in most groups were not apparent in Asian participants. Um, and so um, public health interventions targeting this uh, pandemic related anxiety may be warranted and should also include examining and addressing the role of discrimination and racism. And I will in note um, that an important limitation is that group labels can mask heterogeneity um, such as among Asians of different backgrounds. And we didn't have the numbers for disaggregation here but this is important to consider in future research. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd just like to conclude with acknowledging um, a lot of people, our research group, many interviewers who conducted um, all of these interviews and our funding. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Chesla Stava. Um, th and thank all of the presenters for presenting today because you gave us a lot of new insights into some of the um, health disparities that existed within COVID. I've been monitoring the chat and it seems like most of the questions have already been addressed by the presenters. The one question I don't think was answered, and this is for Dr. Barron, is the antibody home testing compared to self-report of COVID positive test published? Yeah, no, that I, I answered it, but it's, it's that, part of the manuscript. Is it part of the right. home antibody testing question? Yeah, so I, I I I send I put in a reference to the methodology for the home test, and um, our reports are in preparation, but not yet published. Um, are there any other questions that people want to submit? Anything for the last few presenters? Um. This is your last chance. So um, I see that we are um, close to being out of time. So I want to thank all the presenters for basically staying on time. <laughs> it makes my job a whole lot easier. And um, as you know, you have the booklet, so everything is in there as well. And you can get a hold of the different um, present presenters. It looks like we go to break now. Erica? I'm so sorry. So we will now uh, go to break um, until 3.15, at which point you'll um, have the option to select a track again, either time use and families or another session on interventions. Um, it'll uh, be the same as it was the other two days. So enjoy your break and um, we'll see you back here. Oh, I'm sorry. Now let's... Um, no, the break is until 325. I'm sorry, I'm having, uh, so we will have a break now until 325 and then we will go to our breakout sessions. Thank you.
Welcome back from the breakouts, everyone. Um, I this is this is the last bit before we go into some networking sessions. And I did want to mention that we've had um, a third networking session added um, in addition to the two run by the SBE Coordinating Center. Um, we will also have one led by Larry Amsell on measuring and intervening on long-term mental health outcomes from COVID. Um, so there will be the option of um, one, two, or three the third breakout session. Um, but before we get there, I wanna thank everybody for their amazing presentations, um, for keeping time for just overall, generally um, a wonderful set of two days of, of presentations. I thank you for all your research and for coming here to share um, your work with us. I think this has been beneficial for both um, for the NIH folks and for everybody else that has joined. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to introduce um, actually my supervisor, Dr. Christine Hunter, um, to give some final comments before we switch out to, um, to the breakout sessions. Um, Dr. Hunter, would you like to, to start, please? One more second. I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. All right. Can you hear me? That's now? much better. There we go. Thank you. There we go. Uh, so I promise I'll keep this brief, um, but just want to give a big thank you to all the wonderful speakers and all the effort that went into making uh, succinct and useful presentations. I wasn't able to attend the full workshop, but I did review the materials and what I have been able to attend has been absolutely superb. Um, I also want to thank the participants for their active engagement. Um, Active audience engagement really enhances a virtual meeting format and reading the chat and the responses, I think really enhanced um, the, the, the meaning that everybody could get out of this uh, workshop. Um, I'll just speak from uh, OBSSR. We're very pleased to have been one of the five um, Institute Center and Office members of the Executive Committee. Um, this initiative uh, so clearly highlights the importance of behavioral and social science. Um, as you've heard, I'm sure, uh, you know, the focus to improve our understanding of the efficacy and impacts of various mitigation uh, efforts, assess downstream health and healthcare access effects from the economic downturn, and evaluate digital and community interventions um, uh, to ameliorate these health effects. It's just all such important work, and as has been abundantly clear over the last two days, this research is a crucial complement to the overall NIH research response to COVID-19. Um, so our plan at NIH is to develop future opportunities to bring the SBE investigators together to share updates and progress and further facilitate networking. Um, we are very much looking forward to hearing about the continued productivity and data generation from this group. It's been an exciting two days. And so before we close, I just would like to recognize the planning team that made this fantastic meeting possible. Huge thank you to Erica Spots for her leadership and coordination um, of this meeting. Also, thank you to Erica Moore and Alyssa Dolge from OBSSR and uh, the team from Deloitte, Ray Watson, uh, Jake Ganame, and the IT team. I mean, what a superb job. And then finally, I want to thank the terrific SBE COVID co-chairs, John Phillips, Susan Borgia, Jennifer Alvadiras, Dion Goddett, and Deborah Duran. And so just, again, what an outstanding group, what an amazing uh, set of uh, talks. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Erica to note anything I missed. And I wish you all a good afternoon. Thanks so much, Christine. Um, I don't think that um, you have missed anything. Um, I will also um, add my thanks to that group of people as well. Um, certainly couldn't have happened without that help. Um, so thank you for your participation. I hope that you continue to stay actively engaged with the SBE initiative um, through contacts that you've made today and yesterday or through the um, SBE Coordinating Center. Uh, we'll be in touch about future activities and we will request any feedback from the event or ideas that you'd like to share. Uh, the SBE leadership will share our brand new SBE website with you once it is published. It is so new that it is not quite yet published, but will be soon. Um, and at that point, we will also put a recording of this event um, on that website. So as I mentioned, there are um, now three um, 
uh, networking options. The first is the first two are led by the SBE coordinating center measuring behaviors. Um, and then the second one is underrepresented populations. And then the third will be read, uh, led by Dr. Amsel on uh, measuring and intervening in mental health outcomes. Um, so you can uh, pick whichever breakout you'd like to choose. And I think those will be open Shortly. in a minute or two. Um, so just be patient and um, please feel free to join us. Thank you.